Swami Brahmananda It is extremely painful for a spiritual person who thinks constantly of God to talk or hear about mundane things. Once a novelist said to Sri Ramakrishna that the duties of a man were eating, sleeping and having sex. Sri Ramakrishna scolded him, telling him that he was impudent, what you do day and night comes out through your mouth. A man belches what he eats. If he eats radish, he belches radish, one Ramakrishna would feel a burning sensation on his lips whenever he had to talk with worldly people. He desperately searched for companions with whom he could talk about God. One day Ramakrishna fervently prayed to the Divine Mother. Mother, it is my desire that a boy with sincere love for God should always remain with me. Give me such a boy to a few days later, sitting under the banyan tree at Dakshineswar, he had a vision of a boy. He told this to his nephew Hriday who immediately explained its significance with joy. Uncle, you will have a child. What do you mean? said Ramakrishna with surprise. I look upon all women as my mother. How can I have a son? Sri Ramakrishna had a second vision. Just a few days before Rakhal's coming, I saw mother putting a child into my lap and saying, This is your son. I shuddered at the thought and asked her in surprise, What do you mean? I too have a son. Then she explained with a smile that it would be a spiritual child, and I was comforted. Shortly after this vision Rakhal came, and I at once recognized him as the boy presented by the Divine Mother. 3. 2. Sometime in the middle of 1881, Sri Ramakrishna had another vision. He saw two boys dancing on a full-blown lotus floating on the Ganges. One of the boys was Krishna and the other was the same boy whom the mother had previously placed on his lap. That very day Rakhal, crossing the Ganges, came to Dakshineswar from Konagar. The master immediately recognized him as his spiritual son. Rakhal Chandra Ghosh was born on Tuesday, 21st January 1863 at Sikrakulingaram a village 36 miles northeast of Calcutta. He was brought up in rural Bengal. His father, Anandamohan Ghosh, was a wealthy landlord who also made a good deal of money trading salt and mustard seed. His mother, Kailash Kamini, was devoted to Krishna, so she named her son Rakhal, literally cowherd boy, a playmate of Krishna. When Rakhal was five years old, his mother died while giving birth to quadruplets. To maintain the household and to raise Rakhal, Anandamohan married Hemangini Sen, a daughter of Shyamlal Sen of Calcutta. She was a loving young woman and cared for Rakhal as if he were her own son. Rakhal was a handsome, energetic young boy. He was good at sports, gardening and fishing. His early academic career was excellent. He was fond of devotional singing. When the village minstrel would sing Kirtan, he would listen with rapt attention and try to learn the songs. As a young boy, he would practice meditation in the Kali temple and during Durga Puja he would sit behind the priest and meditate like a yogi. From his childhood Rakhal was quite by nature and deeply religious. In 1875 when Rakhal was 12, Anand Mohan took him to Calcutta for his higher education. He was admitted to the training academy and later the Metropolitan School and stayed with his stepmother's family. Rakhal met Narendranath Dutta in a nearby gymnasium. They became close friends as they were the same age and had a similar religious inclination. As a member of the Brahmo Samaj, Narendra was committed to belief in a formless God with attributes and thus did not believe in Hindu gods. In his enthusiasm, he persuaded Rakhal to embrace the Brahmo creed. Rakhal was by nature devotional and contemplative. He began to neglect his schoolwork and gradually lost all other worldly interests. Anandamohan was disturbed when he heard of Rakhal's spiritual inclination. 
to divert his son's mind from god to the world he arranged rakhal's marriage without any enthusiasm rakhal obediently accepted his father's decision in the middle of 1881 rakhal married vishveshwari mitra an 11 year old sister of manmohan mitra who was a devotee of ramakrishna ironically it was his bride's brother who took rakhal to ramakrishna in times 1977 june or july 1881 and later made it possible for him to renounce the world as soon as the master saw rakhal he told manmohan with a smile a wonderful receptacle then the master asked him what is your name rakhal chandra ghosh hearing the word rakhal the master went into ecstasy and softly uttered that name rakhal the cowherd boy of vrindavan after regaining normal consciousness the master treated him as his own and at last said come again during one of his visits to dakshineswar in 1881 Rakhal had a spiritual experience. Ramakrishna later recalled, Rakhal had his first religious ecstasy while sitting here in his room massaging my feet. A Bhagavata scholar had been expounding the sacred book in the room. As Rakhal listened to his words, he shuddered every now and then. Then he became altogether still. His second ecstasy was at Balaram Basu's house. in that state he could not keep himself sitting upright he lay flat on the floor rakhal belongs to the realm of the personal god he leaves the place if one talks about the impersonal for because rakhal believed in the personal aspect of god when he went to the kali or krishna temples with the master he would bow down to the deities this was against the brahmo creed one day narendra observed this and took him to task because rakhal's action was in violation of his pledge rakhal had a gentle nature so rather than argue with narendra he began to avoid him knowing rakhal's predicament the master said to narendra please do not intimidate rakhal he is afraid of you he now believes in god with form how are you going to change him Everyone cannot realize the formless aspect of God at the very beginning five from then on Narendra a true lover of freedom never interfered with the new direction of Rakhal's religious attitude they remained close friends until the end of their lives in the beginning Rakhal visited the master now and then later he began staying at Dakshineswar his father objected to this telling him to concentrate on his studies when he found that rakhal did not listen he became angry and put his son under lock and key there is a saying the more love is obstructed the more intense it becomes lonely homebound rakhal longed for the master on his part ramakrishna worried about rakhal and he went to the temple and prayed mother my heart is breaking for rakhal please bring him back to dakshineswar the divine mother answered his prayer one day while anand mohan was absorbed in looking over some legal documents rakhal quietly left the room and then ran to dakshineswar anand mohan knew where rakhal had gone but could not do anything for a few days since he was busy with a lawsuit although there was little chance of winning that case anand mohan did win he felt that his victory was due to his son's virtue and the blessings of ramakrishna he went to dakshineswar to see his son as well as to see the saint there rakhal was scared when he saw his father in the distance but the master reassured him why are you frightened parents are living gods as soon as your father arrives bow down to him respectfully if the divine mother wishes everything will be favorable six when anand mohan arrived ramakrishna gave him a hearty welcome and rakhal humbly bowed down to him which melted his father's heart the master praised rakhal ah what a nice character rakhal has developed look at his face and every now and then you will notice his lips moving inwardly he repeats the name of god 
and so his lips move. Youngsters like him belong to the class of the ever-perfect. They are born with God-consciousness. Ah, what a sweet nature Rakhal has nowadays. And why shouldn't it be so? If the yam is a good one, its shoots also become good. Like father, like son, Seven Ananda Mohan was overjoyed listening to Ramakrishna's spiritual talk and the praise of his son. Moreover, he noticed that some lawyers and deputy magistrates were among Ramakrishna's visitors, he was eager to get acquainted with them to advance his personal interests. Ananda Mohan returned home without raising much objection to his son's living with the master, but asked him to send Rakhal home now and then. As for the family of Rakhal's wife, the master said later, they raised no objection because the ladies used to come here very often. Soon after Rakhal first came here, his mother-in-law brought Vishveshwari, his wife. I wanted to see if she would stand in the way of Rakhal's devotion to God. I examined her physical features minutely and saw that there was no cause for fear. She represented an auspicious aspect of the Divine Shakti. I sent word to the Nahabat, i.e., to Sarada Devi, to give her a rupee and unveil Vishveshwari's face. 8. This is the traditional ceremony by which a mother-in-law welcomes her daughter-in-law. Since Rakhal was the spiritual son of Ramakrishna and Sarada Devi, Vishveshwari became their daughter-in-law. Living with Sri Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna behaved towards Rakhal as a mother to her child. Rakhal acted like a little child rather than a boy of 18. It was a mystical relationship beyond human comprehension. M. Recorded on 29th March 1883 in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Swami Brahmananda Times 79 Rakhal was not feeling well. The master was greatly worried about him and said to the devotees, You see, Rakhal is not well. Will soda water help him? What am I to do now? Rakhal, please take the prasad from the Jagannath temple. Even as he spoke these words, the master underwent a strange transformation. He looked at Rakhal with the infinite tenderness of a mother and affectionately uttered the name of Govinda, a name of Krishna. Did he see in Rakhal the manifestation of God Himself? The disciple was a young boy of pure heart who had renounced all attraction to lust and greed. And Sri Ramakrishna was intoxicated day and night with love of God. At the sight of Rakhal, his eyes expressed the tender feelings of a mother, a love like that which had filled the heart of Mother Yasoda at the sight of the baby Krishna. The devotees gazed at the master in wonder as he went into deep samadhi. Nine later, Ramakrishna recalled, In those days, Rakhal had the nature of a child of three or four. He treated me just like a mother. He would keep running to me and sitting on my lap. He wouldn't move a step from this place. He never thought of going home. I forced him to, from time to time, lest his father should forbid his coming here altogether. Sometimes I fed him and played with him to keep him happy. Often I'd carry him around on my shoulders. Ten on one occasion the master was so struck with his simplicity that he burst into tears as he said, You are so simple. Ah, who will look after you after I am gone? Eleven, a real guru acts into roles, loving mother as well as chastising father to train his disciple. The master did not spoil his spiritual son. When he did anything wrong, said Ramakrishna, I scolded him. One day he took butter from the temple prasad and ate it without waiting for me. How greedy you are, I said. You ought to have learnt from being here to control yourself. He shrank into himself with fear and never did that again. Twelve one day Rakhal was very hungry and mentioned it to the master. There was no food in his room, so the master went to the Ganges and called loudly, Hello, Gordasi. Please come. My Rakhal is hungry. 
After a short while Gorima and Balaram arrived at Dakshineswar by boat with Rasagolas, cheese balls soaked in sweet syrup. Immediately the master called, Come, Rakhal. They have brought Rasagolas. Come and eat. Didn't you say you were hungry? Embarrassed, Rakhal blurted out, Sir, why are you talking about my hunger in front of others? What does it matter? said the master. Since you are hungry, you should eat. What is the harm in saying so? Thirteen once Rakhal found a coin on the street. Out of kindness he picked it up and gave it to a beggar. As a child finds joy in telling his mother everything, so it was Rakhal's nature to inform the master of everything. When the master heard what Rakhal had done, he reprimanded him, why would a person who does not eat fish go to the fish market? If you did not need money, why did you touch it? 14. What wonderful logic! The master wanted his spiritual son to be free from lust and gold, the two great obstacles in spiritual life. One early afternoon Rakhal arrived from Calcutta and found the master alone, resting on his bed. He asked Rakhal to sit on the bed and massage his feet. At first Rakhal was reluctant, but the master insisted, saying, Look, there is a tangible result from serving a holy man. Soon after he began massaging the master's feet, he saw the Divine Mother, in the form of a girl of seven or eight, circle the master's bed a few times and then enter into his body. This vision overwhelmed Rakhal. The master then said to Rakhal with a smile, Did you see the result of serving a holy man? 15. On 22nd July 1883, while rubbing oil on the master's body on the semicircular veranda, Rakhal requested the highest spiritual experience from him. But the master ignored his demand. When Rakhal persisted, the master scolded him harshly. In a temper tantrum, Rakhal threw away the oil cup and stalked off with the intention of never returning. Before he got past Jadu Malik's garden house, his feet suddenly became numb and he was forced to sit helplessly on the ground. The master sent his nephew Ramlal to bring him back. The all-forgiving master said to Rakhal, Look, could you go? I drew a boundary line there, 16 that afternoon. Rakhal and M were in the master's room. They heard Ramakrishna talking with the Divine Mother, O oh Mother, why hast thou given him only a particle? After a brief pause, he added, I understand it, Mother, that little bit will be enough for him and will serve thy purpose. That little bit will enable him to teach people. M felt that the master was transmitting spiritual powers to his disciple and he recorded, Sri Ramakrishna was still in a state of partial consciousness when he said to Rakhal, You were angry with me, weren't you? Do you know why I made you angry? There was a reason. Only then would the medicine work. The surgeon first brings an abscess to a head. Only then does he apply an herb so that it may burst and dry up. 17. A couple of evenings later, Rakhal saw the master walking towards the Kali temple, and he followed him. Ramakrishna entered the temple, but Rakhal sat for meditation in the Natmandir, the hall in front of the mother's temple. After a while he suddenly saw a brilliant light, like that of a million suns, rushing towards him from the shrine of the Divine Mother. He was frightened and ran to the master 7's room. A little later Ramakrishna returned from the shrine and saw Rakhal. Hello, asked the master, did you sit for meditation this evening? Yes, I did, answered Rakhal. He then related what had happened. The master told him, you complain that you don't experience anything. You ask, what is the use of practicing meditation? So why did you run away when you had an experience? 18. Spiritual life is not always easy. It has many ups and downs. Rakhal had to pass through various ordeals and difficulties. He later recalled, One morning I was meditating in the Kali temple. 
I could not concentrate my mind. This made me very sad. I said to myself, I have been living here so long, yet I have not achieved anything. What is the use of staying here then? Forget it. I am not going to say anything about it to the master. If this depressed condition continues another two or three days, I shall return home. There my mind will be occupied with different things. Having decided this in the shrine, I returned to the master's room. The master was then walking on the veranda. Seeing me, he also entered the room. It was customary after returning from the shrine to salute the master and then eat a light breakfast. As soon as I saluted the master, he said, Look, when you returned from the shrine, I saw that your mind seemed to be covered with a thick net. I realized that he knew everything, so I said, Sir, you know the bad condition of my mind. He then wrote something on my tongue. Immediately I forgot my painful depression and was overwhelmed with an inexpressible joy. 19 Another day Rakhal was meditating in the Natmandir and the master arrived in an ecstatic mood. Addressing Rakhal, Shri Ramakrishna said, Look, this is your mantram and there is your chosen deity. 20 Immediately Rakhal saw the luminous form of God in front of him and was overwhelmed. He was convinced that his Guru had the power to show God to anyone. Filled with ecstatic devotion, Rakhal fell at the feet of the Master and again became absorbed in meditation. Under Ramakrishna's guidance, Rakhal began to practice intense spiritual disciplines. He forgot day and night as well as food and family. The Master taught his spiritual son various kinds of spiritual disciplines, such as asanas, postures, nudras, gestures, japam, meditation, yoga, and other practices. One day, the master initiated Rakhal into the path of Shakti before the Divine Mother and taught him how to practice meditation on six the different centers of the Kundalini. Rakhal used to secretly practice these disciplines. Rakhal recalled, once I was meditating in the Panchavati at noon while the Master was talking about the manifestation of Brahman as sound, Shabda Brahman. Listening to that discussion, even the birds in the Panchavati began to sing the Vedic songs and I heard them. To while practicing sadhana, Rakhal developed some occult powers. Once a worker in the temple garden became sick and there was no one to look after him. Rakhal served him day and night. One night the patient was in deep pain. Since he had no medicine, Rakhal sat near his head and began to repeat a mantram. After a while he became drowsy, a beautiful, luminous girl of twelve then appeared before him. Recognizing her to be a goddess, Rakhal asked, Mother, will this patient be cured? Yes replied the girl and disappeared. The next day the patient was miraculously cured. 22 Ramakrishna was a hard taskmaster. He always insisted that his disciples unite their mind and speech. One day when Rakhal returned from Calcutta, the master asked, Why can't I look at you? Have you done anything wrong? No, Rakhal replied, because he understood wrong action to mean stealing, robbery or adultery. The master again asked, Did you tell any lies? Then Rakhal remembered that the day before, while chatting and joking with two friends, he had told a fib. The master told him, Never do it again. Truthfulness alone is the spiritual discipline in the Kali Yuga, the Dark Age, Dot 23 Ramakrishna demonstrated his teachings through his life and actions. Rakhal later recalled, Oh, how deep was the Master's devotion to truth! If he happened to say that he would not eat any more food, he could not eat more, even if he was hungry. Once he said that he would go to visit Jadu Malik, whose garden house was adjacent to the Dakshineswar temple garden, but later forgot all about it. I also did not remind him. 
after supper he suddenly remembered the appointment. It was quite late at night, but he had to go. I accompanied him with a lantern in my hand. When we reached the house we found it closed and all apparently asleep. The master pushed back the door of the living room a little, placed his foot inside the room and then left. 24 Ramakrishna seldom travelled alone. Someone always went with him to protect his body in case he went into Samadhi. On 2nd May 1883, the master attended the Brahmo festival at Nandanbagan, Calcutta, accompanied by M. Rakhal and a few devotees. At 9 pm, when the worship service was over, the host was busy serving dinner to his important visitors, forgetting the master and his devotees. M. recorded Master, to Rakhal, what's the matter? Nobody is paying any attention to us. Rakhal, angrily, Sir, let us leave here and go to Dakshineswar. Master, with a smile, keep quiet. The carriage hire is three rupees and two annas. Who will pay that? Stubbornness won't get us anywhere. You haven't a penny and you are making these empty threats. Besides, where shall we find food at this late hour of the night? 25. After a long time, dinner was served to the master and he returned to Dakshineswar late at night. Rakhal learned from the master that it would have been inauspicious for the household if a holy man had left the place without eating. Sometimes people who go to yogis or holy men have worldly motives, such as to win a lottery or to be cured of a terminal disease. One day, while the master was talking with Rakhal in the northeastern veranda of his room, he saw a phaeton enter the temple compound. Immediately he rushed to his room and told Rakhal to tell the people in the carriage that he was not available. Does a holy man live here? asked one visitor. Yes, answered Rakhal. Through inquiry he learned that they had come for medicine from the holy man for their sick relative. Rakhal told them, Sri Ramakrishna does not give any medicine, but Durgananda Brahmachari, who lives near the Panchavati, does. When they left, Rakhal came to the master, who told him, I saw a gloom of tamas in them, so I couldn't look at them. That is why I ran away to my room. He then asked Rakhal, When you see a person, can you recognize his character? No, sir, answered Rakhal. That day the master taught him various signs by which one can recognize the character of a person. This later helped him to manage the Ramakrishna Order.26 In the early part of 1884, while walking towards the pine grove, Sri Ramakrishna fell near the garden railing and dislocated a bone in his left arm. He had been in an ecstatic mood at the time and no one was with him. Rakhal felt guilty about this accident. The master consoled him, You aren't to blame for it, though you are living here to look after me, for even if you had accompanied me, you certainly wouldn't have gone up to the railing. Gradually Rakhal became so absorbed in japam and meditation that it became difficult for him to serve the master. On 20th June 1884, Sri Ramakrishna said to M. Rakhal is getting into such a spiritual mood that he can't do anything even for himself. I have to get water for him. He isn't of much service to me. Rakhal now lives here as one of the family. I know that he will never again be attached to the world. He says that worldly enjoyments have become tasteless to him. His wife came here on her way to Konagar. She is 14. He too was asked to go to Konagar, but he didn't go. He said, I don't like merriment and gaiety. When an avatar is born as a human being, he behaves like a human being. A great soul like Rakhal, who was an Ishwar Koti, a godlike soul, Nityasiddha, an ever-perfect soul and a companion of Krishna had a little boyish jealousy. It was quite unbearable for him, said Sri Ramakrishna, 
if I loved anyone but him. He would feel wounded at heart, at that I felt greatly concerned lest he should harm himself by being jealous of those whom mother would bring here. 27. In August 1884 Rakhal became sick and was sent to Calcutta for treatment. Later he went to Vrindavan with Balaram for a change. Just prior to that the master saw in a vision that the mother was removing Rakhal from Dakshineswar. He eagerly prayed for his spiritual son, mother, he, Rakhal, is a mere boy, quite ignorant, that is why he sometimes feels peaked. If, for the sake of your work, yoke remove him from here for some time, keep him in a good place and in a blissful mood, 28 in Vrindavan Rakhal again became sick, which greatly concerned the master. He knew that Rakhal's past life was connected with Krishna in Vrindavan, if he were to remember that, he might give up the body. The master prayed to the mother and sire comforted him. Gradually Rakhal got well and stayed there nearly four months. After returning from Vrindavan, Rakhal went to his home in Calcutta. He visited the master at Dakshineswar and met the new young disciples. He realized then that his guru belonged to all as the moon shines equally upon all and his jealousy left him forever by the grace of his guru. The master noticed that various entanglements were hovering over Rakhal. His relatives and friends were insisting that he take a job and lead a regular householder's life. On 1st March 1885, the master said to Manmohan, Rakhal's brother-in-law, you may take offence at my words, but I said to Rakhal, I would rather hear that you had drowned yourself in the Ganges than learn that you had accepted a job under another person and become his servant. 29 On 7th March 1885, Ramakrishna said, Rakhal is now enjoying his pension. Since his return from Vrindavan, he has been staying at home. His wife is there. But he said to me that he would not accept any work times even if he were offered a salary of a thousand rupees. 30. On 16th April Ramakrishna said to Girish, Rakhal has now understood what is good and what is bad, what is real and what is unreal. He lives with his family, no doubt, but he knows what it means. He has a wife. And a son has been born to him. But he has realized that all these are illusory and impermanent. Rakhal will never be attached to the world. He is like a mudfish. The fish lives in the mud, but there is not the slightest trace of mud on its body. 31. If a devotee sincerely loves God, he makes everything favorable for him. Shama Sundari, Rakhal's mother-in-law was a devotee of the Master and she understood Rakhal's spiritual inclination. One day Manmohan's aunt said to her, It seems that your son-in-law is turning into a monk. Why don't you try to bring his mind back to the world for your daughter's sake? What can I do? answered Shama Sundari. Everything depends on the will of the Lord. If my son-in-law becomes a monk, I shall regard it as a great blessing. 30. To the divine play of an avatar and his disciples is beyond the reach of human understanding. Although most of the time they are established in God consciousness, they sometimes act like human beings. Ramakrishna told some devotees that Rakhal had a little desire for enjoyment and by the grace of the mother it was now over. Through the grace of the Master Rakhal demonstrated true renunciation, he was from a well-to-do home and had a young wife and a child, but he left everything for God. Oh, what superhuman power the Master had recalled Rakhal. At that time we thought it was merely a peculiar power with him, but we could not understand the nature of it. Now we realize what a wonderful power it was. One day I said to him, Sir, I cannot get rid of lust. What shall I do? He touched me in the region of the heart, muttering some indistinct words. All lust vanished from me forever. 
I have never felt its existence since then. 33. In the middle of 1885 Ramakrishna developed throat cancer and Rakhal began to stay with him at Dakshineswar. On 9th August 1885 M. Recorded in the Gospel. It was 9 o'clock in the evening. Sri Ramakrishna was sitting on the small couch. It was Mahimachran's desire to form a Brahmachakra, a mystic circle prescribed in Tantra in the presence of the Master. Mahima formed a circle on the floor with Rakhal, M. Kishori and one or two other devotees. He asked them all to meditate. Rakhal went into an ecstatic state. The Master came down from the couch and placed his hand on Rakhal's chest, repeating the name of the Divine Mother. Rakhal regained consciousness of the outer world. 34 In September 1885, Ramakrishna was taken to Calcutta for treatment. He lived there for three months. Then on 11th December 1885, he was moved to the Koh Sipore Garden House. Rakhal served the Master along with other disciples. Sometime in the middle of January 1886, the elder Gopal wanted to distribute twelve pieces of ochre cloth and twelve rosaries among some monks. Pointing to his young disciples, the Master said to him, You won't find better monks than these. Give your cloths and rosaries to them. Instead, Gopal offered them to the Master and he himself distributed them to Rakhal and other young disciples. Ramakrishna's health was gradually deteriorating. On 15th March 1886 M. writes, Like a mother showing her tenderness to her children, he, Sri Ramakrishna, touches the faces and chins of Rakhal and Narendra. A few minutes later he says to M. Dot, If the body were to be preserved a few days more, many people would have their spirituality awakened. Such is not the will of God. Rakhal, tenderly, Please speak to God that He may preserve your body some time more. Master, that depends on God's will. Rakhal, we pray that you may not go away and leave us behind. Sri Ramakrishna smiles and says, A band of minstrels suddenly appears, dances and sings, and it departs in the same sudden manner. They come and they return, but none recognizes them. 35 Once at the Koh Sipore Garden House Ramakrishna remarked, Rakhal has the keen intelligence of a king. If dot he chose, he could rule a kingdom. Narendra understood that the master wanted Rakhal to be the future leader of his disciples, so he told his brother disciples, Henceforth, we shall call Rakhal our Raja, king. The master was pleased when he heard this. Later Rakhal became known in the Ramakrishna order as Maharaj or Great King. Days of Austerity and Pilgrimage After Sri Ramakrishna's passing away on 16th August 1886, his disciples were drowned in sorrow. Rakhal and the others felt helpless and moreover, some had no place to live. But with the financial help of Surendra Mitra and the guidance of Narendra, they established the Ramakrishna Monastery at Barnagore. In the third week of January 1887, they took their final monastic vows by performing the traditional Virajahoma, tire ceremony, in front of the master's picture. Rakhal became Swami Brahmananda. Shortly after this, his father went to the monastery to persuade him to return home. But he calmly and firmly said to his father, why do you take so much trouble to come to me? I am quite happy here. Now bless me that I may forget you and you may forget me. Cutting off all family ties and attachments, Brahmananda became so absorbed in japam and meditation that he almost forgot the world. In the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, M. recorded a conversation he had had with Brahmananda in the Barnagore Monastery. Rakhal, Earnestly, M. Let us practice sadhana, spiritual disciplines. We have renounced home for good. When someone says, You have not realized God by renouncing home, then why all this fuss? Narendra gives a good retort. He says, 
because we could not attain Ram, must we live with Shyam and beget children? Ah! Every now and then Narendra says nice things. M. Dot, what you say is right. I see that you to have become restless for God. Rakhal M. How can I describe the state of my mind? Today at noontime I felt great yearning for the Narmada, a holy river in central India, favoured by ascetics. Many people think that it is enough not to look at high face of a woman. But what will you gain merely by turning your eyes to the ground at the sight of a woman? Narendra put it very well last night, when he said, Woman exists for a man as long as he has lust. Free from lust, one sees no difference between man and woman. M. Dot, how true it is. Children do not see the difference between man and woman. Rakhal, therefore I say that we must practice spiritual discipline. How can one attain knowledge without going beyond Maya? 36. In November 1888, Brahmananda went to Puri for a short time, and then in the early part of 1889, he visited Kamrapukur and Jairambati, the birthplaces of Ramakrishna and Holy Mother. In December 1889, Brahmananda decided to practice intense austerities alone in the holy places of India. He received permission from Holy Mother and Swami Vivekananda, but they insisted that Swami Subodhananda go along and look after him. Brahmananda and Subodhananda first went to Varanasi via Deoghar and stayed a month. From Varanasi they went to Omkamat, situated on the bank of the holy river Narmada. Here Brahmananda lived continuously in Samadhi for six days, completely oblivious of the outside world. After Omkamat they visited Panchavati, on the bank of the river Godavari, a holy place connected with the life of Ramchandra. They then went to Bombay, and from there by steamer to Dwarka, a place associated with Krishna. They also visited Bet Dwarka, Orbandar, Junagad, Girnar, Ahmedabad, and Pushkar. Brahmananda was not an ordinary pilgrim. I lay saw the living presence of gods and goddesses in these holy places. I ate a he said, spiritual life begins after Nirvikalpa Samadhi, the highest transcendental experience. 37 In February 1890, Brahmananda and Subodhananda arrived at Vrindavan, the place where Krishna sported as a child. Here they lived on alms and passed their line in intense spiritual practices. On 29th March 1890, Brahmananda wrote a letter to Balaram Basu describing his spiritual struggle. Who can understand the divine play of God? Man experiences happiness and misery according to his own karma. This is true of every man whether he is learned or ignorant, good or wicked. Rare indeed is a person in this world who enjoys uninterrupted peace and bliss. Blessed is he who is free from desires, for he lives in the kingdom of peace. There is more misery than happiness in this world, and most people live in misery. If God is all-merciful then why do His children suffer so much? Only God knows the answer to this mystery, and not ordinary human beings. Man suffers because of his ignorance, which manifests as I and mine. The really happy and fortunate man is he who has given up his ego and has surrendered his life, mind and intellect to God and has nothing to call his own. The nature of the mind is to dwell on worldly objects because it is created out of the three gunas, sattva, rajas and tamas, which also constitute the outer world. It is only through divine grace that a man can withdraw his mind completely from the external objects and put it on God. Presently my mental condition is not good at all. I am praying to God that I may remain absorbed in the thought of the Master. That is the one desire of my heart. 38 A great receptacle like Brahmananda was not satisfied with a few visions or momentary experiences. He was feeling the agony of separation from the Master. He plunged into deep meditation and remained most of the time in an indrawn mood.
Subodhananda would beg food for him. Sometimes Brahmananda would eat it and sometimes not. Although the two brother disciples lived together, they hardly spoke to one another. Also living in Vrindavan at this time was Vijakrishna Goswami, a Vaishnav saint who had known Brahmananda when he was living with Ramakrishna at Dakshineswar. One day Vijay asked him, The Master Swami Brahmananda times 89 gave you all that is comfortable in spiritual life, visions and samadhi. Why then do you still practice so much austerity? Brahmananda humbly answered, the experiences and visions I got by His grace, I am now trying to attain as my permanent possession. 39. Observing Brahmananda's hardship, rigorous disciplines and long meditation and prayer, Subodhananda said to him, The Master looked upon you as His son. You are the veritable son of the Lord. It does not befit you to sit like a beggar seeking His grace. Brahmananda replied, What you say, brother, is true. The Master loved us so dearly that He gave us everything He had to give. Still we have not attained peace. This shows that it now lies with us to do the rest for the fulfillment of life's objective. Uddhava was Krishna's dear friend, yet Krishna said to him, If you want to properly realize any spiritual truth, you must go to some solitary place in the Himalayas and practice austerity. I can grant you some miraculous visions, if you like. But that won't be enough. It is much greater to contemplate and meditate on Him. Indeed, without meditation and contemplation none can know anything about God. 40. In April 1890 Subodhananda left for a pilgrimage to Hardwar and Brahmananda remained alone in Vrindavan. The spiritual journey is truly a flight of the alone to the alone. Forgetting the world and his body, Brahmananda again plunged into the inner realm. In May, Brahmananda heard that two important disciples of the Master had died, Balaram and Surindra. He grieved for them. In September, he left Vrindavan and went to Kankhal, Hardwar, in the foothills of the Himalayas, an important place for ascetics. Here he met Vivekananda, Turiyananda, Sardananda and other brother disciples. In November they all went to Merit to see Swami Akhandananda, who was recuperating from a severe illness. In Merit these disciples lived together for nearly six weeks and spent their days in meditation, study, discussion, and devotional singing as they had done in the Barnagore Monastery. In January 1891, Vivekananda left to travel alone in other parts of India. Brahmananda and Turiyananda went to Jwalamukhi, a holy place in Punjab. During the next two years, they visited many holy places in Punjab, Sindh, Rajputana and Maharashtra. In April 1893, in Bombay, they unexpectedly met Vivekananda, who was then making preparations to attend the Parliament of Religions in Chicago. The Swamis then went to Mount Abu and from there proceeded to Vrindavan in July 1893. As God tests the faith of mystics, so mystics also verify God's grace. One day Turiyananda said to Brahmananda, Today I shall not go out to beg for food. Let us see if Radha, the spiritual consort of Krishna and the goddess of Vrindavan, will feed us. 41. Both Swamis passed the whole day and night in meditation, and the next morning a man brought various kinds of food for them. On another occasion, when they were practicing austerities near Lake Kusum, a suburb of Vrindavan, Turiyananda received only a little dry bread from begging. Offering that to Brahmananda, he said, Maharaj, the Master used to take such wonderful care of you. He would feed you with delicacies, and I am feeding you this dry, tasteless bread. So saying, he burst into tears. 42 monks depend solely on God. They sometimes follow the example of a python that attracts its prey without moving. In Vrindavan, Brahmananda took a vow of self surrender accepting only what God provided for him without asking, that day a devotee provided his food and other necessities, unasked.
Another day while he was meditating a man put a new blanket in front of him and left. After a short while a thief came and took away the blanket. Brahmananda silently observed the play of Maya and smiled. Temptation is one of the tests of spirituality. The queen of Bharatpur heard about Brahmananda and Turiyananda and came to visit them at Lake Kusum. She was very much impressed by Brahmananda's serene face and offered some sweets to him. When the Swami opened one of the sweets, he found a gold coin inside. Immediately he put the sweet down, informed Turiyananda about the queen's rich offering and both secretly left the place. The Swamis then went to Ayodhya, the birthplace of Ramchandra. They could not remain there long because of a famine. One day Turiyananda went to beg for food and was given some boiled kachu, an edible root. As soon as they had eaten, their throats began to sting and bum, and gradually their mouths and tongues swelled. Seeing Brahmananda suffering, Turiyananda went out to find a lime, an antidote for the allergy. He found a lime grove, but he could not see any fruit or the trees. He sought out the owner of the grove but was told that the fruit was out of season. Passing the grove again, he keenly searched the trees and he unexpectedly saw a lime. With the permission of the owner, he plucked the lime and ran back to Brahmananda with it. It immediately relieved his painful throat. That night Brahmananda lamented, addressing Ramakrishna. Master, why did you take me from home if you could not provide a morsel of food? Tomorrow morning if I get hot khichuri, rice and lentils cooked together and pickles, I shall understand that you are with me. The next morning the Swamis went to bathe in the Sarju river. A monk arrived and said to Brahmananda, Swami, I understand that both Swami Brahmananda times 91 of you fasted yesterday. Please come to my cottage and have some prasad, which I offered to Lord Rama. The monk served hot khichuri and pickles to the swamis. They greatly enjoyed the meal. The monk then said, Blessed am I. For the last twenty-four years, I have been practicing sadhana here in order to have a vision or to hear the voice of Lord Rama. Today the Lord has blessed me. Tears trickled from the monk's eyes. At Brahmananda's request, he elaborated, While I was sleeping last night I saw that Lord Rama touched my body with his soft hand and said, Get up. I am hungry. Cook khichuri and offer it to me. Tomorrow morning you will see two devotees bathing at the ghat of the Sarju river. They are fasting. Offer my prasad to them. It is by your grace that I had the vision of Lord Rama. While returning to their cottage, Brahmananda related to Turiyananda the mystery behind the incident. 43 When Brahmananda left Calcutta to practice austerity, his wife Vishveshwari raised their little child, Satyananda, and lived like a nun. She practiced severe austerities and died in the fall of 1891. The boy was then raised by his uncle and occasionally lived with his grandfather. The disciples of the master were very fond of the boy and wanted him to become a monk. Unfortunately, in 1895 Satyananda was severely injured in an accidental fall. His chest was badly injured. When he returned to Calcutta, Brahmananda visited his son several times. His wealthy father, Anand Mohan tried everything to save Satyananda, but he died on 20th April 1896 at the age of 10.44. Shortly after, Anand Mohan passed away. Brahmananda absorbed all these tragedies and remained as unperturbed as a mountain. During this period of sadhana, Brahmananda heard about Vivekananda's success at the Parliament of Religions in America in September 1893. Vivekananda was now urging his brother disciples to band together and carry on the mission of the Master. In 1892 the Ramakrishna Math had been moved from Barnagore to Alambazar. 
In January 1895, Brahmananda created a great stir of enthusiasm among his brother disciples when he returned to them at the Alambazar Monastery with Swami Vivekananda. Vivekananda returned to Calcutta from the West on 19th February 1897 and received a wonderful reception from his brother disciples and the public. When Vivekananda's carriage reached Pasukti Basu's house in Bagbajar, Brahmananda came forward and garlanded their leader. Swamiji bowed down to Brahmananda and remarked with respect, the son of the Guru should be treated as the Guru himself. Brahmananda also immediately bowed down to Vivekananda, saying, the elder brother is like one's father. 45 Swamiji then handed over to Brahmananda all the money he had collected from the West for the Indian work and said, Now I am relieved. I have handed over the sacred trust to the right person. Because there was not enough room in the Alambazar monastery, it was arranged that Swamiji and his Western disciples should stay in Gopalal Villa in Barnagore. After the civic reception in Calcutta on 28 February, Swamiji accompanied Brahmananda and others to Darjeeling to rest as well as to discuss the future of the Ramakrishna order. On 1 May 1897, Vivekananda, Brahmananda and other disciples and devotees of Ramakrishna gathered in Balaram Basu's house, Calcutta, and formed the Ramakrishna mission. Vivekananda became the general president and Brahmananda became the president of the Calcutta Centre. Vivekananda was the leader of the order and Brahmananda was his friend, philosopher and guide. He implemented Swamiji's plans concerning the management of the Alambazar Monastery as well as the Ramakrishna Mission's philanthropic activities. Brahmananda was extremely practical and endowed with strong common sense. Sweet and loving by nature, he had above all other qualities a tremendous spiritual power that enabled him to evaluate people's abilities. In February 1898, the monastery was moved from Alambajar to Nilambar Mukherjee's garden house in the Belur village. A plot of land was purchased there on the bank of the Ganges. Under Swamiji's direction, the brother monks took the responsibility of leveling the ground and building the living quarters and shrine. On 9th December 1898, Swamiji consecrated the relics of Sri Ramakrishna in the shrine of Belur Monastery. Brahmananda used to handle the accounts, keep the monastery's diary, supervise the monastery and give spiritual instructions to the novices. Whenever you give lectures, Maharaj said to the monks, please use Sri Ramakrishna's teachings as much as possible because it is easy to understand the true import of the scriptures through his teachings. The master used to say that there should not be any theft, i.e., hypocrisy, in the inner chamber of the heart. He had great affection for the simple-hearted. He used to say, I don't care for flattery. I love the person who calls on God sincerely. The Master also said that all impurities of the mind disappear when one calls on God with a sincere heart. 46. Once a Western gentleman came to Swamiji with some spiritual questions. He sent the gentleman to Brahmananda, saying, There is a dynamo Swami Brahmananda times 93 working and we are all under him. 47. Another time Swamiji said to his disciple Sharat Chakrabarti, even I have not the spirituality that Rakhal has. He is the jewel of our monastery, our king. 48. Brahmananda was always concerned about Swamiji's health, as he suffered from asthma and other ailments. One day Girish Ghosh came to visit Swamiji at Belur Math and heard that he was sick in bed. After a while, Girish saw Swamiji downstairs and said, I heard that you had become seriously ill. Swamiji said jokingly, You see, when I close MJ, eyes to sleep, I see Rajas, Brahmanandas, face full of anxiety for me. I am walking now, so that he will be happy. He wants to make me a patient. As a matter of fact, I am all right. Afterwards, Swamiji praised Brahmananda's administrative capacity, 
I have been stunned to see Raja's work. How nicely he is running the monastery. Sri Ramakrishna used to say about him, he could run a kingdom, 49 on 20th June 1899, at the request of his Western devotees and brother disciples, Vivekananda left for the West to recover his health. He returned to Belur Math in December 1900, still his health was poor. He knew that he would not live long, so he resigned from the presidency of the Ramakrishna Math and Mission and made Brahmananda president. The Swami held this paramount position until he died more than two decades later. The relationship between Vivekananda and Brahmananda was wonderful. Both were Nityasidas and Ishwarkotis, born to fulfill the mission of Sri Ramakrishna. They had known each other from their school days and had perfect mutual trust and understanding. Whenever Vivekananda's pets disrupted Brahmananda's flower and vegetable gardens in the monastery, they would have a childish war of words that was very amusing to anyone who witnessed it. Vivekananda introduced a rule that every monk must go to the shrine very early in the morning and practice meditation absentees would have to beg for their food that day outside the monastery. One morning Swamiji found that Brahmananda and some other monks were not in the shrine. He reminded them of the rule and left for Calcutta because it would have been unbearable for him to see the sad plight of his brother disciples. After his return the next day, he was overjoyed when he heard that Brahmananda had had a sumptuous meal at a rich merchant's house in an adjacent village. Sharat Chakrabarti recorded the following incident that took place in 1902. The disciple, Sharat, passed the preceding night in Swamiji's room. At 4 a.m. Swamiji roused him and said, Go ring the bell to wake up the monks and brahmacharins from sleep. Following this order, the 94 times disciple rang the bell near the monks who hurriedly got up, and after washing they went to the shrine for meditation. According to Swamiji's instruction, the disciple rang the bell vigorously near Brahmananda's room, which made him remark, Good heavens! This Bangui, Sharat, originally from Bangladesh, has made it too hot for us to stay in the mat. When the disciple reported this to Swamiji, he laughed heartily and said, Well done, 30 Swamiji wanted a ghat and an embankment built on the bank of the Ganges at Belur Math, Swami Vijnanananda, an ex-engineer, was interested with completing the project. He underestimated the cost, but Brahmananda took the risk of finishing it. When Swamiji learned that the budget had been exceeded, he scolded Brahmananda harshly. The Swami went to his room, closed the door, and cried profusely. Afterwards, Swamiji tearfully apologized, Brother, please forgive me. I know how much the Master loved you, and never said a harsh word to you. And I, on the other hand, for the sake of this petty work, have verbally abused you and given you pain. I am not fit to live with you. I shall go away to the Himalayas and live in solitude. Brahmananda, also upset, said, Don't say that, Swamiji. Your scolding is a blessing. How can you leave us? You are our leader. How shall we function without you? 51 Gradually both of them calmed down. One day after lunch while Swamiji was resting at Belur Math, he asked his disciple Sharat Chakrabarti to give him a little massage. Sharat was happy for the opportunity to serve his Guru, but Swamiji didn't like his massage because, out of respect, Sharat massaged him gently. Swamiji asked him to call Brahmananda, who had just then gone to rest. When Brahmananda arrived, Swamiji said, Raja, I don't feel good today. I asked this Bangal to give me a massage, but he did not do it well. So I have called you. Immediately Maharaj began to massage Swamiji vigorously, like an expert, and continued for a couple of hours. When the exhausted Brahmananda returned to his room, Sharat went to him and said, Maharaj, 
I have come to you to resolve my confusion. I have heard that you are the spiritual son of the Master, and I have seen how much Swamiji respects you. I don't understand why Swamiji asked you to give him a massage. At this Brahmananda said, What do you say? Don't you know he is the Lord Shiva himself? 52 After fulfilling his mission, Vivekananda prepared to depart from this world by relinquishing his responsibilities, mainly to Brahmananda and Sardananda. When Sister Nivedita asked for some advice about her school, Vivekananda wrote her back on 12th February 1902 in a previous letter, I have written you what little I had to suggest. I recommend you none, not one except Brahmananda. That old man's, Sri Ramakrishna's, judgments never failed, mine always do. If you have to ask my advice or to get anybody to do your business, Brahmananda is the only one I recommend, none else, none else, with this my conscience is clear, 53 Vivekananda had tremendous faith in Brahmananda's loyalty. He would say, others may desert me, but Raja will stand by me till the last. Vivekananda passed away on 4th July 1902. Brahmananda cried like a child over his body. When Sardananda lifted him up, Brahmananda said, It is as if the whole Himalayan mountains have disappeared from before my eyes, as president of the Ramakrishna order. Undoubtedly, the passing away of Vivekananda was a great blow to the monks, but Brahmananda came forward to hold the hem of the Ramakrishna mission with his vast experience and strong common sense, with unselfish love and unbounded compassion, and above all with the personality of a spiritual giant. He could read a person's character at a glance, and he guided the monks accordingly. He told them, Give the whole of your mind to God. If there is no waste of mental energy, with a fraction of your mind you can do so much work that the world will be dazed. 54 As head of the organization, Brahmananda boldly and calmly faced problem after problem. On 14th July 1902, Turiyananda arrived in Belur Math from America and the news of Swamiji's passing broke his heart. Brahmananda and Sardananda received him warmly. Swami Trigunetitananda was sent to San Francisco in place of Turiyananda. Trigunetitananda had been editing and managing the Udbodhan magazine, which had been started by Swamiji. The magazine was passing through a financial crisis. Brahmananda made Swami Shuddhananda editor and came forward to rescue it by raising money and collecting articles from devotees. He himself wrote an article in Bengali entitled, Guru and began to contribute Sri Ramakrishna's teachings serially. After Swamiji's passing away, Sister Nivedita became involved in India's freedom movement. Brahmananda and Sardananda explained to her that the Ramakrishna order had no connection with politics, so she had to choose either to be a member of the freedom movement or of the Ramakrishna order. She chose the former. But Brahmananda was always affectionate towards her and helpful in her educational work. He asked her to write a biography of Swamiji, which was later published as The Master As I Saw Him. Brahmananda was more interested in building the character of the members of the order than in framing rules and regulations that would restrict the monk's freedom. He knew from his experience that religion finds its fulfillment in love and freedom. On the other hand, no organization can function without some guidelines. While framing some rules for the Ramakrishna math at Alambajar, Vivekananda had said, Look here, we are going to make rules, no doubt, but we must remember the main object thereof. Our main object is to transcend all rules and regulations. We naturally have some bad tendencies which are to be changed by observing good rules and regulations and finally we have to go beyond even all these just as we remove one thorn by another and throw both of them away. 55 Kumud Bandhu Sain, a lay devotee, told the following incident which took place in his presence. 
A meeting of the disciples of Ramakrishna had been called at Balaram Basu's house. Probably the year was 1897. The purpose was to consider organizational matters concerned with the new association. Swamiji had brought a proposed table of detailed regulations of conduct. He passed it out for all to study. All considered it carefully and each except Maharaj made comments, suggested changes and gave approval. But Maharaj remained silent. Then Swamiji asked, Raja, what is the matter? Why don't you say something? Don't you like it? Maharaj replied, No, Narin. I don't like so many rules and regulations. Then Swamiji took the draft of that section and without a word just tore it up and threw the pieces away. 56 At Alambazar Monastery, Swamiji had dictated 24 rules to Swami Shuddhananda for the guidance of the newly admitted Brahmacharins, and he had framed the general rules at Nilambar Babu's garden house at Belur, which were recorded by Swami Shivananda. One morning at Belur Math, wrote Swami Basudevananda, these rules of the Ramakrishna order were read aloud in Swami Brahmananda's room. The revered Swami was seated on his small cot absorbed in deep meditation. Swami Shuddhananda was the reader. When the reading was over, Brahmananda said, Swamiji did not utter these rules from the physical plane, he raised his mind to a higher realm and then gave dictation and Tarakda, Swami Shivananda, wrote them down. He delineated them with a view to spreading the ideas and ideals of Sri Ramakrishna and for the good of humanity. Everyone, whether man or woman, rich or poor, high or low, has an equal right to the spiritual heritage and service of Sri Ramakrishna. Blessed is he who serves the Master and follows his teachings. Accept those instructions of Swamiji with candid faith, practice them in your lives and then spread them in all directions. As a result you will see that the evil influence of the dark age will diminish and the golden age will come in sight. 57 On another occasion, Swami Dhirananda asked Brahmananda to make some rules for the young monks. He replied, Swamiji has already made the rules for us. We do not need to add any new ones. Add more love, attain more devotion, and help others to move towards the ideal of God. Swami Abhedananda remarked about Brahmananda, love was the dominant theme of his character. As the first president of the Ramakrishna order, he enforced no other law but love, and by that sheer force of love he could dominate over one and all. 58 Brahmananda seldom attended the trustee meetings of the order as most of the time he was away from the monastery. Sardananda, the general secretary, managed the day-to-day -day administration with Brahmananda's approval and consultation. Even when Brahmananda was in Belur Math, he was reluctant to attend the meetings. One day a trustee, a disciple of Swamiji, asked him, Maharaj, why do you make such difficulty about attending the meetings? The Swami answered, Look, the whole world appears shadow-like to me. It is very difficult for me to come and attend to all these details. 59 Nevertheless, wrote Swami Ashukananda, he was very alert about what was going on in the order. How he knew all the things that were taking place nobody could find out, but he knew. And sometimes he could be very embarrassing. Say you had just come to him from another center, he would ask you, well, how is the cow doing? How is the calf? Was there a good harvest in the vegetable garden? How is the orchard? How many mangoes were there this season? I remember he once asked me about a cow and a calf. I felt so embarrassed because I could not give him a right answer at all. He knew everything kept watch over everything, not only the details of the external work, but the spiritual condition of the monks as well. He could guide them, and he would give those who were earnest as much help as they wanted. Sixty-once Sardananda said to a young monk, 
when I say something, you should judge and discriminate whether I am right or wrong, but when Maharaj says something you may safely accept it as true without the slightest doubt. 617 in Northern India during his presidency, Brahmananda travelled extensively in various parts of India to organise the activities of the order. In the middle of 1903 he went to Varanasi and stayed there lower a month. Then he collected some funds to help the Ramakrishna Advait Ashrama, which was struggling financially. A few young devotees of Swamiji had started the Poor Mains Relief Association, which later became the Ramakrishna Mission Home of Service. Brahmananda officially affiliated the group with the order and arranged to buy some land adjacent to the home of service and to construct some buildings on it. He then went to Kankhal, Hardwar, where Swami Kalyanananda, a disciple of Swamiji, had started to serve sick monks in three thatched huts. With the help of a Calcutta devotee, Brahmananda arranged to buy 15 acres of land and he sent Vizna Nananda to supervise the construction of some buildings. Although he was the head of a large organization, karma could not bind him. Whenever he had time and opportunity, he would practice sadhana in one of his four favorite holy places, Varanasi, Kankhal, Vrindavan and Puri. As a true mystic, he could monitor the time when the spiritual current flows in those places. He said, each place has its own time when it is favorable for spiritual disciplines. The auspicious time in Vrindavan is midnight, in Varanasi, from 3 a.m. to dawn, in Puri, afternoon, in Bhuvneshwar and Belur Math at 4 a.m. About Kankhal he remarked, it is a holy place. Here it does not take much effort to be absorbed in japam and meditation. The very atmosphere is wonderful. The presence of the Mother Ganges and the majestic Himalayas make the mind calm spontaneously. The unobstructed sound of Om is always vibrating in the air. He said about Varanasi, Kashi, Varanasi is beyond the universe, a great place saturated with consciousness. A person gets ten times the results if he practices spiritual disciplines here and the mantram becomes living very quickly. 62 After staying one month at Kankhal, Maharaj went to Vrindavan and practiced sadhana with Turiyananda. During this time, Brahmananda recalled how a spirit helped his steadfast devotions. At that time Turiyananda and I were living together and practicing japam and meditation punctually. We did not talk to each other unless we needed to. At 8 p.m. we would eat some bread that we got from begging and then go to bed. Just at midnight we would get up and after washing we would sit for meditation. One night while I was asleep, I was pushed by someone and heard a voice, it is twelve. Will you not sit for meditation? I immediately got up and was a little groggy. I thought that Turiyananda had broken my sleep, but he informed me that he had not. Quickly I finished washing and sat for meditation. I saw a Babaji, a Vaishnav saint, repeating his mantram silently in front of me. Seeing him I was a little scared. I was repeating my mantram and from time to time I would look at him. As long as I was seated on my carpet, I saw him standing, repeating his mantram. Later I used to see him daily in the same way repeating his mantram asterisk 3 one day in Vrindavan, Swami Ambikananda recalled, I accompanied Maharaj to the temple of Radharman. Expert musicians gather there every day in the prayer hall and worship the deity with devotional songs. Maharaj introduced me to the musicians and said, This boy likes to sing the praises of the Lord. This pleased them. They let me sing and accompanied me with drums and cymbals. Everyone liked my singing and one of the priests brought a basket of sweets for Maharaj and said to him, I shall send this basket to your cottage. Maharaj looked at me, pleased, and remarked, 
See what a nice present I get for your singing. It is a great education to live with a God intoxicated person. From Vrindavan Brahmananda went to Vindhyachal via Allahabad. Ambikananda later reminisced. The first night Maharaj, my father, our host, and I slept in the same room. It was nearing midnight when I felt a gentle touch. I woke up. I saw Maharaj dressed and covered with a heavy blanket. He said to me, Get up and dress yourself in warm clothing. I want you to come with me. Without any hesitation I did as I was told, though it did not occur to me at the time to inquire where we were going. Maharaj took a lantern in one hand and a stick in the other and asked me to follow him. We went outside. It was the night of the new moon and pitch dark. The path was uneven. Realizing that I was stumbling, Maharaj gave me the lantern to carry and held me by the hand. I asked him then, where are we going? He replied, to see the Divine Mother. When we entered the temple compound, we found the place crowded with worshippers. Some were counting beads and others were chanting the praises of the Divine Mother. There was an intense spiritual atmosphere. The door of the temple was still closed. The priests were decorating Mother's image for the special occasion. When the doors opened, the pilgrims stood up and moved forward slowly to have the darshan sight of Mother. In the meantime, the priests caught sight of Maharaj. Seeing his benign face and impressed by his personality, they stopped the pilgrims from proceeding and let Maharaj enter first. He was still holding my hand and I was following one hundred times God lived with them him. When Maharaj stood before the image of the Divine Mother, he exclaimed, Ah! How beautiful! How beautiful! The next moment he was in ecstasy. There was perfect silence in the temple. The priests and pilgrims watched Maharaj's God-intoxicated state in amazement. After a while, still in an ecstatic mood, Maharaj asked me to sing a song to the Divine Mother. While I was singing, tears of joy fell from the outer corners of his eyes. It was a divine sight to behold. Maharaj asked me to sing another song, after which we prostrated before Mother and came out in the courtyard. Maharaj sat down in one corner to perform Japam and asked me to sit also. I said, What shall I do? Maharaj replied, Think of the presence of Divine Mother. Later I shall instruct you. We stayed for a while and returned to the house before daybreak. 65 Brahmananda visited Varanasi several times. In April 1908, he laid the foundation stone of the hospital building of the home of service. Again, he went to Varanasi in 1912, and then in March, he went to Kankhal and stayed until fall. He arranged to have Durga Puja the annual worship of the Divine Mother in the ashrama. He told a monk who was dispensing homeopathic medicine in the hospital, Look, my child, your work pertains to life and death. Don't be overconfident about your capability. When you give medicine, pray to Sri Ramakrishna, Master, help me to select that medicine which will cure this patient. Then you will feel that the Master is working through you. 66. This was his last visit to Kankhal. In November 1912, Holy Mother went to Varanasi with her retinue and stayed at a devotee's house near the two Ramakrishna centers. Brahmananda and other monks accompanied her to show the activities of the Ramakrishna Mission Home of Service. Greatly pleased with the visit, she remarked, Sri Ramakrishna is ever present in the place and Mother Lakshmi always casts her benign glance upon it. As a token of appreciation she gave a 10 rupee note as a donation which is still preserved in the center. Coincidentally, M was then in Varanasi. 
he had often expressed the view that the master did not approve of anyone's performing social service before realizing God, which caused ideological conflict among some monks. At Brahmananda's request, a monk said to M. Dot, Mother has just told us that the activities of the home of service were service to the master himself and that he was tangibly present here. Now what do you say? M. replied with a laugh, How can I deny it any more? 67 Brahmananda had unbounded devotion to Holy Mother. He used to go every morning to pay his respects to her. Fearful of being overwhelmed with emotion, he would bow down to her from the courtyard instead of going upstairs where she was. One day Golapma said, Rakhal, the mother asks why a devotee propitiates Shakti, the Divine Mother, at the beginning of worship. Brahmananda replied, It is because the key to the knowledge of Brahman is in the Divine Mother's keeping. There is no way of communing with Brahman unless the mother graciously unlocks the door. 68 One day Holy Mother visited Samat, about seven miles from Varanasi, where Buddha had preached his first sermon after attaining Nirvana. Swami Nikhilananda wrote, Swami Brahmananda and three other devotees followed her in another carriage. The mother went around the place looking at the various ruins associated with Buddha and his followers and noticed that several European visitors, too, were doing so. Referring to the visitors, she said, they built all this in a previous birth, and now they have come back again to see what they did centuries ago. They are speechless with wonder, admiring these amazing relics. While returning to Varanasi, Holy Mother, at the earnest request of Brahmananda, exchanged carriages with him. On the road, the Swami's time's carriage had an accident, though nobody was seriously hurt. When the mother heard about it, she said, I was fated for this mishap, but Rakhal, by force as it were, took it on his own shoulders. I had several children with me, who knows what would have happened to them, 69 as a tree bends when it bears too much fruit, so a real spiritual person bends with humility. Brahmananda taught the monks through his life and actions. Swami Kamleswarnanda recorded the following incident that Maharaj told him. Once it arose in the master's mind that if he could clean the privy, he would believe that his ego had gone. One night he translated his idea into action. The other day I went to visit Lord Vishwanath with a few monks. I was dressed in nice clothing and looked like a dignified Swami. I saw a sweeper sweeping the courtyard of Vishwanath. I found an opportunity to test my humility. I approached the sweeper and asked him to give me his broomstick. I offered him a coin because seeing that I was a monk he was reluctant to give it to me. I took the broomstick from his hand and cleaned the Lord's place. For a couple of hours I got so much joy that I can't describe it. My heart was full. There is an inexpressible joy in humility. I felt more joy cleaning the temple than visiting the deity. 70 Brahmananda had collected some teachings of Sri Ramakrishna in Bengali, which were first serially published in the Udbodhan and later translated into English under the title Words of the Master. During this visit to Varanasi, he completed the book. When he was working on the manuscript of those teachings, he would not allow anybody to stay in his room. Sometimes Maharaj would get up at midnight and ask his attendant to bring the manuscript to him. Once, after correcting it, he said, The master came and told me he didn't say that. I said this, 71 Sardananda wrote in his introduction to that book, The present brochure is from the pen of one who was regarded by the master as next to Swami Vivekananda in his capacity for realizing religious ideals. It is indeed the work of grateful love of the beloved disciple, one who, more than anyone else, lived constantly with the Master to set the Master correctly before the public, 
seeing how his invaluable words are being roughly handled, deformed, and distorted nowadays at the hands of many. Karma Yoga is inscrutable. It is a wonderful path for purifying the mind, but if it is not performed in the right spirit, it breeds ego, power struggles, bickering, and dissension. In Varanasi The Ramakrishna Advait Ashrama and the home of service are located side by side, some untrained monks of both centers formed rival groups and started to quarrel among themselves. Turiyananda and Sardananda tried to reconcile their differences but failed. Brahmananda was then at Bhuvneshwar. When he was informed of the situation, he replied, Don't do anything. I am coming to see for myself. On 20th January 1921, Brahmananda arrived at Varanasi. The novices were scared to death, thinking that the Swami would punish them or at least call some meetings. He did not call any meeting or raise any question regarding work or quarrels. He simply announced that all the monks from both centers would have to meditate with him in the morning and evening and that there would be devotional singing and questions and answers after meditation. Thus a few days passed. Then, on Swamiji's birthday he initiated 40 members of the ashramas into sannyasa and brahmacharya. He lifted their minds to such a high level that they forgot all their friction. One of the ringleaders was so inspired that he left for the Himalayas to perform austerities. Peace returned to both centers. Seeing that Brahmananda had won the battle without a fight, Sardananda complimented him, it would be proper for you to be a king rather than a monk. Where both Turiyananda and I could not figure out the solution, how easily you solved this crucial problem, 70 to a disciple of Brahmananda wrote in his reminiscences. Maharaj had the power to change the atmosphere of a place and to make it vibrate with his spirituality. In his company he could make everybody roll with laughter and then suddenly, when he became silent, the place would be surcharged with a divine presence. Swami Turiyananda once remarked that Maharaj used to create such an atmosphere around himself that everyone present would be filled with some of his spiritual mood. Many people used to come to Maharaj for the purpose of seeking advice about their problems. But once they were near him they felt no necessity to ask for any solution. Problems solved themselves in his presence and people would forget themselves their egoism, temporal pleasure and pain, and be filled with intense divine bliss. 73 During this last visit to Varanasi, Brahmananda gave nine spiritual discourses to the monks, which are invaluable for seekers of God. The spiritual teachings of Brahmananda from 1897 to 1922 were first published in Bengali as Dharma Prasange Swami Brahmananda and have been fully translated into English as a guide to spiritual life. This book is a classic in practical Vedanta literature in South India. In 1897 Vivekananda had sent Ramakrishnananda to Madras to spread the message of the Master in South India. In 1908 Ramakrishnananda invited Brahmananda to visit and went to Puri himself to escort him to Madras. Before leaving Madras, Ramakrishnananda told Sister Devmata, Laura Glenn, an American devotee, and Brahmachari Rudra to make everything ready to receive Maharaj. Remember, he reiterated, Swami Brahmananda was like his own son and when you see him, you have a glimpse of what Sri Ramakrishna was. The self in Brahmananda is entirely annihilated. Whatever he says or does comes directly from the Divine Source, 74 Ramakrishnananda accommodated Brahmananda in his room, which had been renovated especially for that purpose. He said, The faster and his son will stay inside. I will stay out in the entrance hall and serve them. What more do I want? 75 He told the South Indian devotees, You have not seen the Master, be content to see Maharaj. One day a devotee brought some fruits for Ramakrishna, 
but Ramakrishna Nanda offered half to Maharaj, saying, to offer these fruits to Maharaj is as good as offering them to Sri Ramakrishna. For the Master eats through his mouth. 76 V. Krishna Swami Iyer asked Ramakrishna Nanda whether the 104 times God lived with them knew Swami would give any lecture in Madras. Smiling, Ramakrishna Nanda replied, What is there in lectures? He never gives lectures. Men such as he can impart religion by a mere look or touch. 77 Sister Devmata recorded some touching incidents about Brahmananda in her days in an Indian monastery. Sometimes Swami Brahmananda's approval was wholly dumb and unspoken. One day he laid in my hands a folded pongi shawl with the words, Sister, can you mend this for me? Some insect has eaten little holes all through it. I prize it because it was given me by Ram Babu, a devotee of Ramakrishna. I took it home, tinted some sewing silk the exact shade, and darned each little hole with meticulous care. It consumed the whole day, and in the evening I sent the shawl back. Swami Brahmananda was delighted with it and showed it to everyone explaining that I had done it, but he never mentioned it to me. He did not wish to cheapen a loving service by an ordinary expression of thanks. One evening while he was at Madras, he went into Samadhi during Aarti, Vesper service. He sat on the rug at the far end of the hall, his body motionless, his eyes closed, a smile of ecstasy playing about his lips. Swami Ramakrishnananda was the first to observe that he did not move WH and the service was over. Realizing WHAT had occurred, he motioned to one of the young Swamis to fan his head. For half an hour no one stirred. A boy who was crossing the hall did not even draw back his foot. Perfect stillness pervaded the monastery, a radiant, Pulsing stillness.78 During Christmas time, Brahmananda asked Sister Devmata to arrange a Christmas party in Western fashion. She could not get a Christmas tree, but she bought a plum cake, glassy fruits, and other items from an English shop. The boys brought green branches from the jungle and bound them to the pillars in the hall and decorated the entrance with mango leaves and garlands. A Christmas altar was set up, and bread and wine were offered as a symbol of the Christian Eucharist. Sister Devmata narrated the event. Swami Brahmananda asked me to read the story of Christ 7's birth, and I chose the account of Saint Luke. When I finished reading, the intense stillness in the air led me to look toward Swami Brahmananda. His eyes were open and fixed on the altar. There was a smile on his lips, but it was evident that his consciousness had gone to a higher plane. No one moved or spoke. At the end of twenty minutes or more the look of immediate seeing returned to his eyes and he motioned to us to continue the sending. Lights, incense and burning camphor were waved before the altar, the evening chant and hymn were sung. All those present bowed in silent prayer and the Christmas service was ended as he was eating he remarked to me, I have been very much blessed in coming to your house today, sister. I answered quickly, Swami, it is I who have been blessed in having you come. You do not understand, he replied. I have had a great blessing here this afternoon. As you were reading the Bible, Christ suddenly stood before the altar dressed in a long blue cloak. He talked to me for some time. It was a very blessed moment. 79. After staying some days in Madras, Brahmananda was accompanied by Ramakrishnananda on a pilgrimage in South India. First, the Swamis went to Rameswaram on the coast of the Indian Ocean and stayed three days as the guests of the Raja of Ramnan. After their arrival, both Swamis went to visit the Lord Shiva and then returned to the palace. Brahmananda scolded his attendants who were busy unpacking the luggage. Can't he these things wait? You have come here to worship the Lord and that is what you should attend to first. 
On the second day Brahmananda and Ramakrishnananda ceremoniously worshipped the Lord with Ganges water that Maharaj had brought from Varanasi. From Rameswaram on the way to Madras they stopped at Madurai to visit the famous Meenakshi temple and stayed three days in the city. Ramakrishnananda wanted to escort Maharaj to the inner sanctuary so that he could see the mother closely. Customarily, only Brahmans are allowed to enter there and Brahmananda was born as a Kshatri, royal or warrior caste. At the entrance Ramakrishnananda shouted, Alvar, Alvar I, an illumined Vaishnav saint, and as a result the priests did not stop them. At in the temple Brahmananda had a wonderful vision, which he later described, When I stood in front of the deity, I saw the living image of Mother Meenakshi coming towards me, and I lost outer consciousness. 81 Realizing that Maharaj was in ecstasy, Ramakrishnananda held him up for nearly an hour in the midst of a large crowd and he himself chanted the glory of the Divine Mother with tearful eyes. Afterwards the Swamis came out of the shrine. Then they returned to Madras. Ramakrishnananda took Brahmananda to Kachipuram where he visited Mother Kamakshi, Shiva and Vishnu, the famous deities. On 20th January 1909, Brahmananda inaugurated the Ramakrishna Ashrama in Bangalore. It was a grand celebration. The high officials of the Mysore state attended the function. Brahmananda read his address, which made an excellent impression on the audience. This was the only time that Brahmananda ever spoke in public. In Bangalore, Maharaj was so impressed with Ramnam Sankirtan, choral singing in praise of Lord Ramchandra, that he introduced it to the order, and he himself would join in the singing. Swami Umananda, a disciple of Brahmananda, was working in Madras. He became ill with smallpox and was admitted to the hospital, where Ramakrishnananda visited him every day. A couple of days before he passed away, Umananda expressed a desire to see Maharaj. When Ramakrishnananda communicated this to Brahmananda, he showed concern but did not go to the hospital, thinking that the disease might be contagious. After Umananda's death, Ramakrishnananda said with tearful eyes, Maharaj, you are so cruel. Umananda wanted to see you once in his final hours and you did not go. Immediately Maharaj became grave and then slowly said, Shashi, is it enough to see a person through the eyes? Have I not been there? Ramakrishnananda bowed down and said, Maharaj, please forgive me, I did not understand you. 82 Ramakrishnananda died in 1911. In July 1916 Brahmananda revisited South India. He laid the foundation stone of the new monastery building in Madras and then went to Bangalore on 12th August. This time he extensively visited the important holy places of the south, Chamunda Devi in Mysore, Lord Padmanava in Trivandrum, Kanyakumari, the Virgin Goddess at Cape Kamarin, Perambudur, the birthplace of Ramanuj, Lord Ranganath at Trichy and Lord Balaji Venkateshwara in Tirupati. When Brahmananda visited those holy places, the deities would manifest themselves to him. From time to time he would talk about his visions. In Kanyakumari, I was about to burst into laughter out of joy. I saw the goddess as an eight or ten-year-old girl giggling. It was a beautiful, awesome, living form. 83 In Tirupati Maharaj saw the Divine Mother in the image of Lord Venkateshwara. His body shivered in ecstasy. Later he said to Swami Sharvananda, I have distinctly seen the form of the Divine Mother. Please inquire about it. 84 After inquiry and close examination of the image and sanctuary, it was found to have been originally a Shakti temple, later converted into a Vishnu temple, probably under the influence of Ramanus. In April 1921, Brahmananda went to Madras with Shivananda and inaugurated the Madras student's home. Then he spent the summer in Bangalore and returned to Madras in October. 
Following his suggestion, Durga Puja was performed with the image in the monastery. Swami Swami Brahmananda Times 107 Ashokananda recalled, Once I managed to ask him a certain question very early in the morning. He told me plainly, You know I cannot do anything without the command of God. Yes, he was so close to God that we believed, and with good reason, that he was always in contact with him. I have heard that he often saw God in the form of Sri Ramakrishna and in other forms as well. Eighty-five in Madras, a dozen nuns from Maharashtra lived in a convent and Gopala, baby Krishna, was their chosen deity. They heard about Brahmananda and invited him to visit their shrine. Maharaj went there with some monks. When Maharaj sat in a chair, the chief nun placed a silver tray below his feet. Then each nun washed Maharaj's feet with scented water and wiped them with her hair. His feet were then placed on aval, wet cushion, and the nuns worshipped him with a garland, flowers, and sandalpaste. When the worship was over, each nun carried a small pitcher of milk on her hip and a glass in her hand. Then, encircling Maharaj, they began to dance and sing this famous song of their Saint Namdeva. Drink this milk, my Lord, Gopala. Drink this milk, O son of Nanda, this I, Namdeva, bring you milk with my own hands. Considering Maharaj to be the living Gopala, the nuns poured milk into his mouth, but it ran down his chin because he was in Samadhi, and they wiped his chin with a handkerchief. When he regained outer consciousness, he asked his attendant to sing a song. Later, hearing about this incident, Sardananda remarked, Here the memory of Maharaj's real nature began to awaken. 86 in East Bengal in January 1916, Brahmananda went to Dhaka with Premananda and a few other monks to lay the foundation stone of the Ramakrishna mat. On the way, they visited the holy temple of Kamakya at Guwahati. He stayed there for three days and performed a special worship to the Divine Mother. Then the party stopped at Maimensing for five days. One day while walking on the bank of the Brahmaputra river, Maharaj exclaimed, My mind is merging into the infinite. On 13th February, after arriving at Dhaka, Maharaj laid the foundation stone of the center. One morning Maharaj said, Last night I saw the Master dancing here. The Master himself is preaching, We are only instruments, 87 on their arrival at Dhaka, great enthusiasm was generated in that historic city. Many distinguished people and young students flocked to visit the disciples of Ramakrishna. Maharaj inspired and initiated many of them. He visited the ashrama of Vijakrishna Goswami and also Devbhog, Narayanaganj, the birthplace of Saint Durgacharan Nag. Brahmananda was impressed with the rural beauty of the place and the devotion of the people. When Brahmananda was at the railway station, waiting for the train to Calcutta, a young girl who was a devotee's sister bowed down to him and asked for some advice. Maharaj told her, Daughter, the train is coming. I don't have much time, but I will give you knowledge in one sentence. Read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna regularly every day. That is enough. You will find in this book the truth of all religions. 88 in Puri and Bhuvneshwar many times Brahmananda visited Puri, a lovely city on the coast of the Bay of Bengal. Once Sri Ramakrishna had advised Rakhal to go on a pilgrimage to Puri rather than to Gaya, because in Gaya he might merge into the Divine and not return to the relative world. In Puri Brahmananda used to stay at Shashiniketan, a retreat home of Balaram Basu. The holy shrine of Lord Jagannath, Krishna, the wholesome climate and the panoramic view of the sea coast kept him in a highly spiritual mood. Quite often Brahmananda would experience ecstasy while visiting the deities Jagannath, Balaram and Subhadra, Krishna, his brother and his sister in the inner sanctuary of the temple. 
One day he saw a cowherd boy in place of the deities, perhaps he saw his own real nature as the eternal companion of Krishna. During the chariot festival of Jagannath, according to custom, he would help pull the chariot containing Lord Jagannath's image. He experienced all-pervading consciousness in Puri and established a monastery at Chakratirtha near the coast. One day Atal Bihari Matra, the deputy magistrate of Puri, said to Swami Sharvananda, a disciple of Maharaj, What kind of monks are you? You have no occult powers. Hearing this Maharaj said, It is easy to get occult powers, but difficult to acquire purity of mind. It is this purity of mind that really matters. 89 In 1917 while returning from Puri, Brahmananda stopped at Bhuvneshwar to visit the famous Lingaraj Shiva temple. He stayed there three days and felt a wonderful spiritual atmosphere. He arranged to purchase a plot of land for a monastery. The monastery was dedicated on 31st October 1919. He commented, This place is very conducive to practicing yoga. It is a place of Lord Shiva, a hidden Varanasi. Practicing a little spiritual discipline here, one can accrue immense results. It is a healthy place. After getting tired from working in other places, the monks may come here to rest as well as practice meditation. 90. He also advised the householder devotees to build homes around the center and to lead a quiet life in solitude. Maharaj visited Bhuvneshwar many times for health reasons and also trained some monks in that isolated retreat. One day he reminisced about Sri Ramakrishna. The master's body was so tender that once while breaking a luchi, crispy fried bread, his finger was cut. At this a gentleman remarked, how is it possible for a person to cut his finger by breaking a luchi? Brahmananda immediately became silent. If anyone interrupted him, his mood would break and he could not talk further. 91 In 1920, Pandit Shirod Prasad Vidyavinod went to see Brahmananda at Bhuvneshwar. Shirod lamented, There was a possibility of my seeing Sri Ramakrishna, but it was my bad luck that I did not. I was then a student. After hearing about the master, one day I left for Dakshineswar. After arriving at Alambazar, I thought, the master knows what is in everybody's mind. If he exposes my secret thoughts in front of everybody, I will be embarrassed. This fear sent me back home. Maharaj said, since you went to Alambazar to see the master, take it for granted that you did see him. No, Maharaj, I did not see him. Remembering his bad luck, Shirod bent his head and began to sob. As soon as he lifted his face, he saw Sri Ramakrishna seated in Brahmananda's place. 92 in Belur Math and Calcutta. Although Belur Math is the headquarters of the Ramakrishna order, Brahmananda was not there most of the time. He was busy founding new centers and inspiring monks and devotees. He handed over the management of the daily activities to Premananda and Shivananda. When he stayed at Belur Math in between his travels, a festive mood would prevail among the monks. Many devotees and distinguished people would come to see him and receive spiritual instructions. Brahmananda lived a God-intoxicated life, yet at the same time he knew what went on around him. He would supervise the care of the trees, flowering plants, vegetable garden and dairy. He would check the cleanliness of the shrine as W. Poundalil as the rooms of the monks. He would inquire about the health and spiritual progress of the monks and brahmacharins. He was a loving father, compassionate guru and at the same time a stern taskmaster. He could not bear any lack of discipline among the monks. He reminded them, this is Swamiji's math. If you cannot live according to his wishes, leave the monastery. Swamiji gave his very life to build this organization and to give you everything to facilitate your spiritual practice and growth.
Try to realize the infinite love he bore for you, 93 a monk recorded in his diary. It is winter, December 1915. Nowadays Maharaj has made a rule that all monks and brahmacharins should rise at 4 a.m. and should sit for japam and meditation by 4.30 a.m. Some practice meditation in the shrine, some in Maharaj's room and others on the veranda facing the Ganges. An attendant of Maharaj has been interested with the duty of ringing a bell at 10 minutes to 4. Maharaj gets up about 3 a.m. His sleep is very short. After practicing meditation for two to two and a half hours, all assemble in his room by 7 a.m. and sing devotional songs for about an hour. Then Maharaj gives spiritual instructions to all. He elevates the mind of each six or seven steps. 94 Brahmananda also taught the monks the secret of work. Simply carrying out some undertaking is not sufficient. It must be done in the right spirit, knowing that one is serving the Lord without any personal motive. Keep three-fourths of your mind fixed on God, and with the remaining one-fourth do whatever you have to do. If you follow this method, you will be an ideal karmayogi, and you will attain peace and joy. On the other hand, if you only get involved in activities without practicing meditation, ego and pride will crop up and quarrels and dissensions will ensue, thus disturbing the equanimity of your mind. Therefore, I tell you, stick to your sadhana by all means whether you work or not. Each and every work is equally important whether it is meditation or household duties. Do it with the right spirit. Work is worship.95 One day Maharaj wanted to test the depth of the monk's morning meditation. He ordered each monk to peel a potato and bring it to him. He checked those potatoes and then held one up and declared that the peeler of that one had had deep meditation. That person was Swami Shuddhananda, a disciple of Vivekananda. Maharaj noticed that he had removed the skin of the potato so neatly that no flesh was wasted. One time a rich merchant lost his young wife. To assuage his grief, he came to Belur Math to live with the monks. After some time he felt uplifted by the influence of the holy company and decided to donate all of his money and his business to the Ramakrishna mission. At that time the financial condition of the order was poor. Premananda was moved by the donor's good intention and he informed Maharaj of the offer. The farsighted Brahmananda realized that the merchant's renunciation was temporary and that the order would be in trouble if it accepted this donation. Without disclosing this insight, he told Premananda, with folded hands, brother, having the company of the holy that man got renunciation, and having his company shall we be involved in the world, 96 needless to say, the offer was not accepted. There was a young monk in the monastery who was very obstinate and quarrelsome. One day Premananda forcefully took him to Brahmananda and said, Maharaj, this fellow is short-tempered, he quarrels with other monks and even with me. Please touch his head with your palm so that he can be freed from anger. Maharaj jokingly said, Brother Babu Ram, today my palm is not good, you better put your palm on his head. But Premananda insisted and pushed the monk's head near Maharaj's feet. His joking mood immediately disappeared. He became calm and serious. He began to rub the monk's head with his palm. Premananda then pushed the monk aside and placed his own head near Maharaj and requested him to touch it, which he did. Then Premananda loudly called to the other monks, Hello! Please come and take the blessings of Maharaj. He has become Kalpatru, the wish-fulfilling tree, today. All the monks and even the servants rushed to Brahmananda. A doctor devotee was in the bathroom. Before he arrived, Maharaj had gotten up from his seat. When Premananda asked Maharaj to bless the doctor, he replied, 
The power that came has gone. 97 One day Brahmananda told the monks about the supernatural power of a mantram. Swami Nikhilanandari called. Sri Ramakrishna taught Maharaj a man tram by repeating, which one could bring a particular person to one's place. Many years later, Maharaj was at Belur Math when he heard of the arrival of a prominent Maharaja in Calcutta, there was no chance of the Maharajas visiting Belur Math. Swami Brahmananda wanted to test the efficacy of the mantram taught him by the Master. He used it and within a short time the ruler of the native state sent his private secretary to the math to find a convenient time for his visit there. Maharaj was pleased with the power of the mantram. But suddenly he remembered that the master had asked him never to use it. 98 One day a devotee came to Belur Math and complained, Maharaj, I have visited this place for such a long time, still I feel that I am an outsider. Maharaj indignantly told him to go whimper to Premananda. Later, in front of all the monks, he repeated what that devotee had said. Then Brahmananda said to the devotee, Do you know the purport of what you said? Go home and try to reflect on it. Go to the Ghosh sect, an esoteric tantric school, and you will get the result in three days. Be a devotee, be a devotee. Again, addressing Shivananda, Maharaj said, Sir, some people come here and complain that they have been coming to Belur Maeth for a long time and still they are not achieving anything. What does it mean? Shivananda replied, they want more. Their stomachs are not yet full. Maharaj said, it may be that the food has been supplied but has not reached their stomachs. Yes, it may be possible, replied Shivananda. 99 Maharaj indicated, that that devotee would not have visited Belur Math the second time if he had not gotten anything. One day Brahmananda said to M. Dot, the Master came this time to make a bridge between Jiva and Shiva, human beings and God J. See how easy it has now become to realize the Lord. 100 Brahmananda was a man of few words. His life was his teaching. Rather than preaching religion, he demonstrated it. Swami Basudeva Nandari called. It was two o'clock or three p.m. on a hot summer day. Swami Brahmananda was seated in his room at the Belur Monastery. His attendant was fanning him. As soon as I entered his room, he said, Welcome. It is very hot today. Let us meditate on the snow-clad Himalayas, then the Whole atmosphere will be cool. Do you know this mystery? First empty the mind completely. There should not be any samskaras, impressions. Then the mind will automatically fill itself with God consciousness. When W A T R is poured out of a pitcher, does the pitcher remain empty? At once it is filled with space. Didn't space exist in the pitcher before? Yes, it did. It existed mixed with water. We see only the gross water and not the subtle space, so we think only the water exists. Similarly, although the impressions of external objects and pure consciousness are both in the mind, we perceive only the mind's gross impressions because they are within the reach of our senses. We do not see the pure consciousness, which is also in the mind. If one can make the mind free from impressions, pure consciousness, which is Satchidananda, will be immediately revealed. Otherwise, through discrimination one can get a little inkling of Satchidananda. One should discriminate, combining devotion and meditation, and then one will understand the real import of the scriptures, the teachings of the holy men, and Sri Ramakrishna. Again, when a particular satvik, Good impression is established in the mind, replacing other worldly impressions, then that established impression becomes luminous by the light of Brahman. At that time the snow-clad mountain turns into an effulgent form like the living Shiva, and that radiance of Shiva makes the body-mind organism of the meditator cool and calm. 
Thus, after cleansing the mind lake, whatever ideal or ishtam chosen form of God you place there will be radiant and living. Brahman, the pure consciousness, cannot be reflected on a polluted, muddy mind lake where many worldly waves are agitating. Now go ahead. I have given you a very secret teaching. Keep it secret and practice it wholeheartedly. Have you not read Sri Ramakrishna's parable of the wonderful tub of dye? Whenever the dyer was requested to dye a cloth a particular color, he would dip it into that miraculous tub and it would immediately be dyed that color. This mind lake is like that wonderful tub of dye, 101 during that time Belur Math was infested with mosquitoes. Maharaj suffered from malaria and typhoid fever. Once he remarked, I move around because of this horrible malaria. Otherwise who would want to stay away from this glorious monastery? This Belur Math is like Kalash, the abode of Shiva. Here the Guru and the Ganges are present. Swamiji also left his body here. This is Vakuntha, the abode of Vishnu. Dot one zero to another time he said to Shivananda, Tarakda, I shall never be able to cut my attachment for Belur Math. Even after my death I shall watch Belur Math from above. 103. The damp climate and water of Belur Math did not suit Brahmananda, so from time to time he would stay at Balaram's house in Calcutta. Ramakrishna Basu, Balaram's son, was very devoted to Maharaj and served him wholeheartedly. Many young people and devotees would come to Maharaj to have his holy company and listen to his inspiring teachings. He was an awakener of souls. Sometimes he would remind the devotees of Ramakrishna's message. The Master often said, God can be attained if one loves Him with the combined force of these three attractions, the chaste wife's love for her husband, the mother's love for her child, and the worldly man's love for worldly possessions. Sri Ramakrishna's message in this age is renunciation of lust and gold. Pointing to the monks, you have joined the monastery in order to become holy men. Renunciation of lust and gold is the ornament of a holy man and it is the only means of attaining God. As one progresses on the path of spirituality, one is confronted by many kinds of temptations, cravings such as for woman and gold, for name and fame arise again and may lead one farther away from God. Unless 8. I, 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 God lived with them. You beware of this liar in the form all cravings. He will steal dot ill the goodness in you, and you will drown in the bottomless ocean of worldliness. But, on the other hand, here is the ocean of divine grace if anyone will sincerely call on I, honey, but once. The Master used to say, If you move one step towards Him, He comes down ten steps towards you. 104 Swami Nirvanananda related a touching incident that took place in IQ 18 at Balaram's house. One day after lunch, when Brahmananda was about to rest, a teenage girl came with her brother to see him. When Nirvanananda told this to Maharaj, he said that he could see her at 4 pm. But when the girl insisted, Maharaj allowed her to see him in his room. As soon as she saw him, she began to weep. Then pointing to a picture of Sri Ramakrishna, she said, He has asked me to come to you. Maharaj said to her affectionately, Tell me what has happened, my child. Then she told her story. She had been married at the age of 14 and her husband died only two weeks after their marriage. In India at that time this was a disastrous situation. A Hindu widow could not remarry and had to depend on her husband's family for the rest of her life. Faced with this gloomy future, she wholeheartedly prayed, O Lord, what will become of me? I am so lonely and helpless. What shall I do? Please show me the way. After a year or so, 
One night Shri Ramakrishna appeared to her in a dream and said, Don't weep. My son Rakhal is living in Bagbazar. Go to him. He will help you. She had never heard of Ramakrishna or Rakhal. Without telling her in-laws about the dream, she came to visit her mother in Tolliganj, South Calcutta. Her mother knew about Sri Ramakrishna. Directed by her mother, she went to Sardananda at Udbodhan and he sent her to Maharaj. The girl was with Maharaj for two hours and during that time he initiated her. He then asked Nirvanananda to feed the girl and her brother. The girl later became a nun and established a convent. 105 as a Guru Thay Guru Gita explains the word Guru, Gu means darkness or ignorance, Ru means destroyer. He or she who destroys or removes the ignorance of the disciple is a Guru. Brahmananda was a real Guru. He had the power to impart Samadhi or illumination to anybody. Once Boshi Sen, a young devotee, said to Brahmananda, Maharaj, you are miserly. Why do you say so? asked the Swami. Because you have the power to give the experience of God to others, but you are withholding it. Maharaj gravely said, Who wants God? After becoming president of the Ramakrishna order, Brahmananda began to initiate people, but was very selective. He strongly believed that the disciple and the Guru must know and evaluate each other before initiation. Sometimes people had to wait many years before receiving initiation from him. There were three known reasons that prevented him from initiating indiscriminately. First, he followed the injunction of the scriptures, don't make too many disciples. Second, he remembered what the Master had said to Keshab saying, why don't you study their nature? Is there any good in making anybody and everybody a disciple? Third, many times after giving initiation, he would become ill, as he had absorbed the disciples since. However, Holy Mother asked Brahmananda to give initiation to more people, since she alone could not handle all the aspiring devotees. In 1916, Maharaj went to the Minerva Theatre to see a drama about Ramanuj, the exponent of qualified non-dualistic Vedanta. The play portrayed how after Ramanuj's initiation, his guru told him that whoever repeated the mantram would be liberated, but were he to divulge it to anyone, he himself would go to hell. The large-hearted Ramanuj immediately went to a crowded place and shouted, I have just received a mantram from my teacher and whoever repeats this will attain liberation. Here it is, take it. This particular scene moved Maharaj and he shed tears. From then on he became more liberal in giving initiation. Brahmananda's spiritual instructions are simple, direct and practical. He taught mostly from his own experience rather than by quoting from the scriptures. Swami Vishuddhananda recalled, On one occasion, in the house of Balaram Basu, Maharaj said, You practice meditation and japam, you progress a little, then comes a period of dryness. It seems that the doors are entirely closed. At that time, it is necessary that you stick to your spiritual practices with infinite patience, by so doing you will find one day that all of a sudden the doors are opened. What a great joy it is then! In spiritual life many such thresholds have to be crossed. Once Maharaj said to a devotee, When you meditate, you should imagine that God is standing before you like the mythical wish-fulfilling tree. Another day he said to the same devotee, At the time of meditation you should imagine that you are in mid-ocean. On all sides there are mountain high waves and God is standing before you ready to help you. In Madras, while I accompanied him on a walk, Maharaj said to me, Just do one thing, always try to remember God. I also do that. 106 Girish Chandra Ghosh, a devotee of Sri Ramakrishna, told the following story about Brahmananda's extraordinary spiritual power. Compared to myself, Rakhal is only a young boy. 
I know that the Master regarded him as his spiritual son, but that is not the only reason I respect him. Once I was suffering from asthma and various kinds of ailments. As a result, my body became very weak and I lost faith in Sri Ramakrishna. With a view to getting rid of that dry spell, I engaged Pandits to read the Gita and the Chandi to me. But still I had no peace of mind. Some brother disciples came to see me, and I told them about the unhappy state of my mind, but they only kept silent. Then one day Rakhal came and asked me, How are you? I replied, Brother, I am in hell. Can you tell me the way out? Rakhal listened to me and then burst into laughter. Why worry about it, said he. As the waves of the ocean rise high, then go down again and again rise, so does the mind. Don't be upset. Your present mood is due to the fact that it will lead you to a higher realm of spirituality. The wave of the mind is gathering strength. As soon as Rakhal left my house, my doubt and dryness disappeared and I got back my faith and devotion.107 There is not much glory in making a good man better. Once Brahmananda said to a monk, If you can't make a bad man good, why did you become a monk? Maharaj was a friend and saviour of the fallen, the dejected and the lowly. When Ramakrishna was alive, Girish had taken many actors and actresses from his theatre to the master for blessings. Later they would visit Holy Mother and Brahmananda. At that time actresses were not accepted by society because, for the most part, they were prostitutes. Tara, one of Girish's actresses, described in her memoirs how Brahmananda's love and blessings changed her life. Ever since I was a little girl, I worked on the stage with Girish Chandra Ghosh and heard from him about Sri Ramakrishna. There was a photograph of Sri Ramakrishna in every theatre with which Girish Babu was connected and the actors and actresses used to bow down to the master's photograph before they appeared on the stage. My first visit to Belur Math took place about six years ago, 1916. I was then depressed and restless. Life seemed unbearable to me. I began to seek out places of pilgrimage. In this unhappy state of mind, I finally went to Belur Math. Binodini, the finest actress of Bengal at the time, was with me. When I was seven years old, she introduced me to the theatre, and again it was she who introduced me to the monastery. It was past noon when we came to the math. Maharaj had finished his lunch and was about to go to his room to rest. At that moment we arrived and prostrated before him. Maharaj said, Hello, Binod. Hello, Tara. So you have come. You are taught late. We have already finished our lunch. You should have let us know that you were coming. We could see how worried he was about us. He immediately ordered fruit prasad and arrangements were made to fry luches for us. We went first to the shrine, then had our prasad and afterwards were shown around the mat by a Swami. Maharaj did not have his rest that day. We were brought up to revere holy men. But along with respect and faith I felt much fear of them. I was impure, a fallen woman. And so when I touched the holy feet of Maharaj, I did it with great hesitancy, afraid to offend him. But his sweet words, his solicitude and love dispelled all my fear. Maharaj asked me, why don't you come here often? I replied, I was afraid to come to the math. Maharaj said with great earnestness, Fear, you are coming to Sri Ramakrishna. What fear can there be? All of us are His children. Don't be afraid. Whenever you wish, come here. Daughter, the Lord does not care about externals. He sees our inmost heart. There should be no fear in approaching Him. 
I could not hold back my tears. My lifelong sorrow melted as the tears fell from my eyes, and I realized, here is my refuge. Here is someone to whom I am not a sinner. I am not an outcast. 108 once in Dhaka, Premananda said to Brahmananda, Swamiji was a savior of the lowly and redeemer of the sinners. Brahmananda immediately replied, I am also a savior of the lowly and a redeemer of the sinners. Tabbu, Matiswar Singh, a young devotee, used to visit Maharaj every day at Balaram's house and would give personal service to him. Unfortunately, one day he committed an immoral act, probably adultery, and Maharaj heard about it. Tabu was ashamed to show his face. One day he secretly came to meet some of his friends, but he accidentally encountered Maharaj. Affectionately Maharaj asked Tabu, Have you seen the big horns of a buffalo? Yes, Maharaj, replied Tabu. Then Maharaj remarked, Look, if a mosquito sits on its horn, does the buffalo feel it or register any pain? Know us to be like that, 109 Another time Brahmananda said, Remove all fear and weakness from your mind. Never debase yourself by thinking about sin. Sin, however great it may seem in the eyes of man, is nothing in the eyes of God. One glance of His can uproot the sins of millions of births in a moment. In order to divert human beings from the path of sin, the scriptures mention heavy punishments for the sinner. Of course, every action bears a result, and evil actions disturb one's peace of mind. 110. In 1921 at Varanasi, a young monk asked, Maharaj, I am practicing japam and meditation mechanically and am not acquiring any taste for them. What should I do? Maharaj replied, Is it possible to get that taste in the beginning? You will have to struggle hard to attain it. Direct all your energy to that one pursuit. Every night before you go to bed think for a while about how much time you have spent in doing good deeds, how much you have frittered away doing useless things, how much you have utilized in meditating, and how much you have wasted doing nothing at all. In the beginning it is good to make a routine and then follow it strictly. It does not matter whether your mind likes it or dislikes it. You must practice your japam and meditation as a daily routine. You have received the precious mantram from your Guru. Now dive deep into the ocean of Satchidananda. You have no self-reliance. Self-effort is indispensable in spiritual life. Do something for a period of at least four years. Then if you have not made any tangible progress, come back and slap my face. 111 The effect of holy company is infallible, it may come immediately or after a period of time. Those who came in contact with Brahmananda experienced a definite change in their lives. Brahmananda reminded the devotees, the holy company you keep, the spiritual talk you hear, all make an impression on your mind. In the course of time you will realize the effects of these things, and the momentous changes that they will bring about in your life. A bumblebee hiding in a fragrant flower offered in the worship touches the feet of the Lord. Similarly, by the grace and association of a holy man, one surpasses even the gods and attains liberation. 112 A real Guru sometimes teaches through silence. Once Swami Satprakashananda came from Dhaka to see Brahmananda at Udbodhan. He bowed down to Maharaj and sat at his feet. Dhirananda, Maharaj's attendant, introduced him to Maharaj, saying, He has some questions. Maharaj looked at him graciously and said, You have seen a holy man, have bowed down to him and touched his feet, what more questions can there be? Satrakashananda wrote, Evidently he meant that this was enough to solve my problems and remove all doubts and difficulties from within. 113 Maharaj once told Swami Prabhvananda, There are times when it becomes impossible for me to teach anyone. No matter where I look, 
I see only God wearing many masks. Who am I, the teacher? Who is to be taught? How can God teach God? But when my mind comes down again to a lower level, I see the ignorance in man and I try to remove it. 114 Some glimpses of Swami Brahmananda Sri Ramakrishna once remarked about Brahmananda, Rakhal is like the kind of mango that looks green even when ripe. He meant that within Rakhal was a great spiritual power that he kept hidden from the outside world. Behind Brahmananda's grave exterior, he was like a frolicsome boy. He would joke and have fun with the monks and devotees. M. once told Vishwananda, a disciple of Maharaj, Observe how Maharaj acts and you will have some idea of what Sri Ramakrishna was like. When his mind came down to the finite plane, his sense of humor was very keen. This was also true of Maharaj, wrote Prabhvananda. One of his favorite jokes was to have some fruits or sweets placed beside a disciple who was meditating. When the disciple had finished his meditation, he would find his favorite dishes laid out before him. Later Maharaj would ask, Well, did you get the fruits of your austerities? 115 Ashokananda recalled. Everything he, Maharaj, did used to touch people's hearts at its deepest level. Once a gentleman who came to visit him was asked to wait a few minutes, the Swami would come. The few minutes ran into half an hour, and when Maharaj finally came, he said to the man in a rather embarrassed way, You see, I was playing cards. I couldn't break away. Please don't mind. He said it with such simplicity that he stole the heart of that man. His childlike moods were delightful. I remember seeing him once at a distance with a young Brahmacharin attendant. He was dancing playfully about like a little boy and making gestures in imitation of a striking cobra. You would think a stalwart, middle-aged man would look very odd playing like that. But I can tell you, it was the most beautiful thing to see. Why? Because this childlikeness was natural with him. He was always fond of children, he liked to play with them, and they responded to his affection. One day when he was visiting Balaram Basu's family, he dressed himself in a bearskin that covered him from head to foot and, thus disguised, appeared before Balaram's grandchildren to scare them. They screamed with genuine alarm, but after the first cry one little boy said through his tears, I know it's you, Maharaj. You can't frighten me. But why did you do it? Then Swami Brahmananda laid aside the bearskin and took the little boy on his lap. 116 Kiran later, Swami Asishananda, who was staying at Udbodhan, was sent to Brahmananda by Sardananda for his Brahmacharya vows. When he approached Maharaj for his blessings, the Swami was quiet for a while. Finally he said, Yes, I will, but there is one condition. You must pay me 108 rupees in advance as Guru Dakshina, honorarium for the Guru. Otherwise, I can't initiate you. Stunned, Kiran replied, Maharaj, I have no money. It is impossible for me to pay such a large amount. If you don't bless me, I am lost. Then Maharaj gravely said, I have a suggestion that will solve your problem. Swami Sardananda is very rich. He has all the money from the Udbodhan. You are his attendant. Go to Swami Sardananda and get him to pay that amount for you. While I was standing there, speechless, Asishananda later wrote, Maharaj called another candidate over to him and said, Govinda, you come from Midnapur. You will have to dance after the fashion that Urisa people are fond of for me. If you do it well, I will give you Brahmacharya. Without hesitation, Govinda performed the dance with suitable gestures of hand to our great delight. Maharaj was pleased with his performance and laughed heartily. Not knowing what else to do, I returned to Udbodhan 
and narrated the whole story to Swami Sardananda with great seriousness. He nodded gravely, Very well, you may return to Belur Math and tell Maharaj that I am his and everything in Udbodhan belongs to him as well. What he asks for will be given. Relieved, I returned immediately to Belur Math, prostrated before Maharaj and repeated Swami Sardananda's message. But to my surprise and dismay, Maharaj shook his head. Empty words, he shouted. How am I to know if he will do as he promises with nothing in writing? You are his secretary. Prepare something for him to sign. When I have his signature, then I will believe it. Again I returned to Udbodhan, my mind in a turmoil. Sadly, I told Swami Sardananda this latest development. The next day we both went to Belur Math and approached Maharaj. After a few moments in his presence, Swami Sardananda suggested it would be better if I waited outside. At length, Swami Sardananda came out of Maharaj's room and spoke to me, It has been arranged that you will have your Brahmacharya woes with the others. 117 Swami Saprakashananda wrote in his memoirs. One day at the beginning of the winter season in 1917, in the drawing room of Balaram Mandir, Maharaj asked me to bring him pen, ink, and Swami Brahmananda one to one AM piece of writing paper. When he began to dictate in English, I took down what he said. The letter was addressed to the abbot, Belur Monastery. At the time, Swami Shivananda was in charge at the Belur Math, as respected Swami Premananda was lying ill in a small room of the Balaram Mandir. The gist of the letter was, the Christmas celebration will surely be observed at your Math. On that occasion we, a party of monks, are coming to the Math. Your hospitality is well known. Certainly at the conclusion of the ceremony, According to the usual custom in Christmas celebrations, there will be an arrangement for the taking of drinks. We are non-vegetarians and are fond of varied courses of meat dishes. In anticipation of a sumptuous feast, we extend to you our heartfelt thanks. May your function be crowned with success in all possible ways, that is our earnest wish. When I had written the letter, I handed it to him for his signature. But instead of putting his own name, he signed Premananda and told me, Go and read the letter to Swami Premananda. Hearing the contents of the letter and finding his signature forged, Swami Premananda simply smiled and said, Maharaj has a childlike nature. One thing has to be especially noted here, both Swami's Premananda and Shivananda were vegetarians. Later Maharaj asked me to go to Belur Math and deliver the letter to Swami Shivananda, but cautioned me not to mention that he had sent it. After reading through the letter, Swami Shivananda looked at me and said, laughing, Maharaj has sent this. Is it not? I kept silent. Swami Shivananda understood, Silence is acquiescence. 118 One morning when Maharaj was walking on the lawn of Belur Math, a young man humbly addressed him, I want to meet Swami Brahmananda. I would like to be a monk. Pointing to Swami Shivananda, who was then taking tea, Maharaj said, You see that heavyset person at the table, he is Brahmananda. The young man bowed down to Shivananda and said, I have come to you. Seeing that unknown person, Shivananda asked, Could you tell me the name of the person whom you want? Swami Brahmananda. He is walking there on the lawn, said Shivananda. Sir, he has told me that you are Swami Brahmananda. No, I am not. Swami Brahmananda is walking there. When the young man returned to Maharaj and reported everything, Maharaj said, No, I am not Brahmananda. You see, Great souls sometimes delude people and do not like to be caught. Go again and hold his feet firmly. The young man again went to Shivananda, got a nice scolding from him and returned to Brahmananda again. Maharaj said to him, 
I have already told you that great souls delude people and even beat people, but you should not leave him. Hold his two feet firmly. The young man became confused and tears came from his eyes. Then Maharaj compassionately said, All right, you can stay in the monastery. 119 It has been said, wrote Christopher Isherwood, that Brahmananda was so entirely fearless that others could not feel fear in his presence. Once, when he was walking with two devotees in the woods of Rivan Yuvanoswar, a leopard appeared and came straight towards them. He stood still and confronted it calmly until it turned tail. Again, while he was going along a narrow lane in Madras, attended by two monks, a maddened bull came charging to meet them. The young men tried to protect their guru, who was already an elderly man, by standing in front of him. But he pushed them behind him with extraordinary strength and fixed his eyes upon the bull. It stopped, shook its head from side to side, and then trotted quietly away. 120 Like other mystics, Brahmananda loved to be in solitude. At times he had no inclination to receive visitors. In 1916 when Maharaj was staying in Bangalore, Josephine MacLeod, an American devotee of Swamiji, tried to have an interview with him. Whenever Maharaj would see her coming from a distance, he quickly disappeared into his room. He then sent Swami Nirmalananda to tell her, Maharaj is not well today. After three days of trying, Miss MacLeod struck upon a plan. She put on a green dress which blended with the lush green scenery, and thus camouflaged, crept slowly along behind the trees and bushes towards the Swami's veranda. Suddenly she leapt in front of him and exclaimed, Naughty boy, now how will you escape? The Swami, embarrassed, stammered, Today I am quite all right. Laughing, Joe said, What else can you say? You have to admit it. I caught you, didn't I? 121 It is amazing and amusing to observe how a knower of God lives in this world and behaves with people. Sri Ramakrishna said about such an illumined soul. He acts like a child or a madman or an inert thing or a ghoul. While in the mood of a child, he sometimes shows childlike guilelessness, sometimes the frivolity of adolescence, and sometimes, while instructing others, the strength of a young man, 122 Swami Sambhavananda recalled some of Maharaj's practical jokes. There was a strong man who advertised in the paper. The advertisement showed a picture of this man, fearfully muscular, with the caption, If you want to become like me. Maharaj would ask his cook or brahmachari attendant to take a stance like that of the muscle and call out, If you want to become like me. Maharaj liked to play word games with Swami Bardananda. In one kind of game the first person tries to think of a word for which the opponent cannot find a rhyming word. For example, Maharaj might call out cricket. If Swami Bardananda could think of no rhyming word, he would lose that round. But if he replied, for example, wicket, then Maharaj lost unless he in turn would think of a third rhyming word. One evening Maharaj kept Swami Bardananda playing the game for an hour and a half. Swami Bardananda was in the kitchen and Maharaj was on the veranda. I was the go-between, carrying the words back and forth. Swami Bardananda finally got bored with the game and sent me to Maharaj with the message, It is late at night. Quickly Maharaj sent back his response, keeping intact his record for rarely being defeated, tell him good night. 123 There are hundreds of stories about Brahmananda's playful jokes. Once a devotee complained, Maharaj, people come to hear your spiritual talk, and you entertain them with funny jokes. Maharaj answered seriously, Look, householders are burning with miseries almost all the time, so I give them some momentary joy. There are very few persons in this world who want spirituality. Those who are sincere, I talk to them about God, 
and I know they will listen to my spiritual instructions and follow them. That is why I don't talk about spiritual matters to all. It is not so easy to practice spiritual disciplines, it needs good samskaras, tendencies, from a previous life, 124 Unconditional Love and Compassion are the two main traits in the mind of an illumined soul. Brahmananda's love was completely natural and he would shower it on each and all, even the animals, trees and plants were not deprived of it. He fed the dog of the monastery, he regularly visited the cowshed and supervised the cows. He kept his eyes on the flower and vegetable gardens of each monastery. Under his supervision South Indian flower and fruit trees were planted in North Indian centers and vice versa. He had a wide range of knowledge in gardening matters. He taught the monks how to water and fertilize the trees and how to control pests. Maharaj had a keen interest in plant life. Boshi Sen reminisced. Once he expressed a desire to see some of J. C. Bose's famous experiments showing the sensitivity of plants to external stimuli. When he visited the Bose Research Institute, he watched the experiments we demonstrated for him with great interest. That evening he was still preoccupied with what he had seen in the laboratory. There was a time he told me, when Thakur, Sri Ramakrishna, could not step on the grass but would jump from one bare spot to another to avoid hurting the grass. At that time we simply didn't believe that grass could be sensitive. From what I saw today, I realized how infallibly true his perceptions were. 125 later in Bhuvneshwar he said, Trees have life. If you serve them you will feel it. Trees never become ungrateful. He who serves them will receive flowers and fruits in return. In Bangalore, when he saw the rose garden of Lalbag, Maharaj remarked, Look, the celestial maidens are laughing. And pointing at the green lawn, he said, As if the Divine Mother has spread green velvet. With his mystical eyes, he would see the worship of the cosmic God all around him. One day a Brahmacharin at Belur Math was picking flowers from the garden for worship of the Master. Observing him plucking the big ones in front, Maharaj told him sharply, What are you doing? Do you want to make that tree devoid of flowers? You think Sri Ramakrishna is seated only in the shrine and does not come to the garden. Pick those flowers for worship that are hidden under the leaves and always leave some flowers in each tree. 126 Maharaj saw that those trees were also worshipping the cosmic God with their blossoms. Towards the end, Sri Ramakrishna had made a prediction about Brahmananda to his close disciples, when Rakhal knows his real nature, his body will not last anymore. The Master never told Rakhal about this vision, and he forbade his disciples to reveal it as well. About 1910, when Sardananda was publishing Shri Shri Ramakrishna Lila Prasanga, Shri Ramakrishna, the great master, in Bengali, Premananda went to visit him in Udbodhan. Sardananda read to Premananda from his manuscript about the master's vision concerning Maharaj. Startled, Premananda said, Sharat, what have you done? Maharaj is still living. Don't you remember what the master said? When Rakhal knows his real nature, his body will not last anymore. 127 Immediately Sardananda removed that part from his manuscript and also called back the proof from the press and destroyed it. One night, while Maharaj was living at Balarams, he suddenly had a vision of Sri Ramakrishna. The master appeared before Maharaj and disappeared without saying anything. Brahmananda sat on Miss Bed and tried to understand the meaning of that vision. He then said to MS Attendant, Suddenly my sleep broke and I saw the Master standing near my bed. He didn't say a single word. I couldn't figure out the cause of his sudden appearance and disappearance. Pausing a little he gravely said, 
I have no desire in my mind. I don't even have the desire to chant His name, only to surrender and surrender. 128 on 1st January 1921, while Maharaj was in Balaram's house, Ramlal, Sri Ramakrishna's nephew, came from Dakshineswar to see him. Immediately Maharaj became jubilant. Ramlal was very dear to him and reminded him of his days in Dakshineswar. Maharaj would tease Ramlal since he was very simple and guileless. Maharaj said to him, Brother, you will have to dress this evening as a gypsy woman and sing the songs that the master used to sing. Ramlal shyly replied, Maharaj, it is not the monastery. It is a devotee's house. Moreover, people may misunderstand me, especially women. But when Maharaj insisted, Ramlal agreed. In the evening Maharaj's attendants borrowed ladies' garments and jewellery from Balaram's family and decorated Ramlal. Maharaj sat on his chair in the big hall. The disciples and devotees sat around him and the ladies watched from the veranda. As soon as Ramlal entered the hall, the audience smiled. He began to sing and dance, twisting his waist and gesturing with his hands before Maharaj. This is part of that song. Ek bar broj chalo brojeswar dinek duya mato. O Lord of Vraja, Krishna is the Lord of Vraja. Vraja refers to his childhood haunt, Vindavan, let us go to Vraja for a few days. O Tor, Momane to Thakbi Setha Nod Asbidrita, if you like that place, stay there or return quickly. Aage Rakhal Chili Akhan Raja Horecho. Previously you were a cowherd, and now you have become a king, etc. When Ramlal repeated the last line, Maharaj's smiling face turned grey. That first line had reminded him of his real nature, and immediately the whole atmosphere changed. 129 He realized what Sri Ramakrishna had seen in a vision long ago about his true nature. He also understood why the Master had silently appeared before him. Maharaj began to prepare himself for his final journey, fulfilling his unfinished mission. On 19th January 1921, Maharaj left for Varanasi with Sardananda to settle an organizational problem and then returned to Belur Math on 16th March. Then he left for Bhuvneshwar with Shivananda on 1st April and afterwards went to Madras on 25th April. This was his last visit to South India. He initiated many people, inspired the monks, and solidified the activities of the order there. Then in November he returned to Bhuvneshwar and went to Belur Math on 12th January 1922. He attended Sri Ramakrishna's birthday celebration at Belur Math on 28th February and initiated three monks into sannyasa. Then one day he said to a monk, Today I shall initiate. Call all who want initiation. His attendant Sardananda remarked, He never speaks that way. Is he going to give up his body? Another day he said to one of his brother disciples, I am now relinquishing my responsibilities. Please take care of everything. 1.30 on 22nd March, Brahmananda left Belur Math for Balaram's house. Before departing, he carefully studied the plan for the Master's temple that had been made under Swamiji's direction and reminded the monks that it was their duty to complete the project. On 24th March, Maharaj contracted cholera at Balaram's and all the best physicians of Calcutta attended him. He recovered from cholera within a week, but his diabetes, which started in 1918, now took a serious turn. All kinds of treatment, allopathic, homeopathic and Ayurvedic were administered to him, but to no avail. He told his attendants, take me to Bhuvneshwar. If I drink that well water, I shall be all right. I don't care for this polluted air of Calcutta. The air of Bhuvneshwar is clean, take me there. One attendant said to him, Maharaj, you are too weak at present. 
when Kaviraj Shyamdas Vachaspati, a noted Ayurvedic physician, came to see Brahmananda, he wore a religious mark, Vibhuti, ashes, on his forehead. Observing it, Maharaj remarked, Sir, the mark of Shiva, which is on your forehead, signifies that Shiva alone is real, everything else is unreal. M. visited Maharaj and asked him if he had any pain. Maharaj calmly replied, Pain takes to its wings when I think how joyfully I passed each day with the Master. 131 On Saturday, 8th April, the burning sensation in his body and his thirst for water increased. At noon, seeing the ladies of Balaram's family crying, Maharaj said to them, Why are you so afraid? I bless you all. In the evening, Dr. Durgapada Ghosh came and inquired about his discomfort. Maharaj answered with a line from Viveka Shudmani, To endure all kinds of afflictions without caring to redress them, this is my present condition, verse 24. All of a sudden his face glowed, and he became absorbed in deep meditation. At 9 p.m. he touched the hand of his attendant, who was seated nearby, and blessed him saying, Don't be afraid, my son. You have served me well be absorbed in God. I bless you, you will attain the care village of Brahman. I say you will attain the knowledge of Brahman. After a rail he blessed other monastic attendants, never forget God, and you will realize the highest good. Do not grieve. I shall be with you always. Then he inquired about Sardananda, who would stay the whole day with Maharaj and at night would return to Udbodhan. A month immediately ran to Udbodhan to bring Sardananda. A deep silence pervaded the room. The monks and devotees encircling Maharaj were anxious. He opened his eyes again and began to speak. I am floating on the banyan leaf of faith in the ocean of Brahman. Vivek, my Vivek, Vivekananda Dada, brother. Baburamda, Baburamda, Premananda. Joge, Joge, Yogananda. I see the feet of Sri Ramakrishna. Thus he was seeing and addressing the diseased disciples of the Master. In the meantime, Sardananda arrived. Seeing him, Maharaj said, Brother Sharat, you have come. My knowledge of Brahman and Vedanta are getting mixed up. You are a knower of Brahman, please tell me about it. My goodness, replied Sardananda, you are full of that knowledge. The Master gave you everything. Then Maharaj said, the Master is real and so is his Leela, divine play. I have almost reached Brahman, only a little veil is left, 132 he wanted to drink a little lemonade and then said with a smile, look, what is this? I am saying Brahman, Brahman, and again lemonade, lemonade. He continued, Father in heaven, look, this is a wonderful idea. It is also a path of God. When Sardananda suggested that he sleep after drinking a little lemonade, Maharaj said, my mind is in the realm of Brahman. It does not come down. All right, pour lemonade into Brahman. After sipping a little he said, Ahaha, Brahman, the reality, the vast ocean. Om Parabrahmane Nama, Salutations to the Supreme Brahman, Om Paramatmane Nama, Salutations to the Supreme Atman. When Maharaj described his experience of Brahman, all felt peace and serenity in their hearts. He slowly calmed down. His face was glowing with joy and he gazed without blinking as if he were meditating or seeing something. After a while he exclaimed in his sweet voice, Ah, here is the full moon, Ramakrishna. I want the Krishna of Ramakrishna. I am the cowherd boy of Vrindavan. Put anklets on my feet. I want to dance holding the hand of my Krishna. Jhum, Jhum, Jhum. It refers to the sound of the anklets dot. Krishna, Krishna, Krishna has come. Can't you see him? You don't have the eyes. Ahaha, how beautiful. My Krishna on the lotus of Vrindavan. It is not sad Krishna. My play is over now.
Look, the child Krishna is caressing me. He is calling me to come away with him. I am coming. Om Vishnu, Om Vishnu, Om Vishnu, 133 Maharaj greeted Shivananda and Abhedananda who came to see him. Sardananda later said, This time we shall not be able to keep Maharaj anymore. His vision of Krishna on the lotus, which the Master forbade us to disclose to him, has come out from his own lips. The doctors expected him to fall into a coma, but he was fully conscious until the end. Boshi Sen wrote in his memoirs, An hour before he gave up his body, he ceased speaking and seemed to have withdrawn to some distant realm beyond the reach of any of us. I was very gently stroking his palm and wondering whether he still remembered that old playful pressure of his thumb. At the same instant I felt it, light but unmistakable, Maharaj's last bequest to me, 134 Ramakrishna's prophecy about his spiritual son Rakhal proved to be true. At 8.45 p.m. on Monday, 10th April 1922, Swami Brahmananda passed away. The next day his body was carried from Calcutta to Belur Math and cremated on the bank of the Ganges. Later a temple was built on that spot. The monks and devotees lost their spiritual teacher, but they preserved some of his precious verbal testimonies in their records. Once in Belur Math a young monk asked Brahmananda, Maharaj, does Sri Ramakrishna exist even now? Maharaj answered, I see you have lost your mind. Having renounced hearth and home, why are we leading such a life? He exists always. Pray to Him day and night for His vision. He will dispel all your doubts and will make you understand His true nature. Do you see the Master nowadays? Yes, replied Maharaj. I see Him whenever He shows Himself out of His mercy. Anyone who has His grace can see Him. But how many people have that love and longing to see Him? 135.